Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, constant reader Scott Daly, and joining me as always, in college they called him the happy slapper, it's Matt Freeman. How's it going today, Matt? That's right. That's right. It was because of the incident, which oh, could we'll you speak of here. Could you elaborate, please, just quickly? Um, you know, I I just really like slapping people in college. <laughs> it was that's it was my where, thing. That's where we're going. Yeah, you remember? Remember how it was kind of yeah. a problem for a while? No, it was like like have you ever seen that Key and Peel skit where it's like the baseball player and he just can't stop hitting people on the ass yeah. in baseball. It was like that, except you were like their face. Like you were yeah. just assaulting people. Yeah. Well, and, and their ass though. Let's be well, honest. I mean, yeah. I, I thought that, I thought, I thought that part was assumed, Yeah, but yeah. sure. Yeah. Good, good talk. <laughs> I'm glad you're, <laughs> I'm glad you're doing better now, man. Yeah. Yeah. I've been working on it <laughs> this week. On the show, uh, we are finishing up Stephen King's Mr. Mercedes by reading and discussing Kisses on the Midway all the way through the end of the novel. Bill and company discover Brady's identity and manage to get to the concert just in time to start stop him. Brady Hartsfeld gets his brain smashed in, but was it by a bunch of ball bearings in a sock? Or just, you know, the really bad music at the show? No, no one knows! Uh, Bill manages to survive a heart attack, and they all live happily ever after. Except for Brady's mom. Except for Brady's well, mom. And um, well, well, well. <laughs> Matt, well, what did you think of this week's reading? Oh, I loved it. It was very intense. It was very um, mm -hmm. like uncomfortably intense. Like I, I, I uh, rushed through this once I had started because King is using every tool in his toolbox to just make you very worried about what's going to happen. And it worked on me. This whole book has worked on me, actually. That'll be maybe one thing that I will talk about more when we do our book overview. But just mm -hmm. in general, I feel like everything he was trying to do really worked on me on an emotional level. And here at the end, this climactic, action-packed finale worked on me on an emotional level as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, really, really loved this book this time through. I can't wait to... to discuss it as a whole next week uh the one thing that really jumped out to me today though and i, I think we'll kind of circle back around to this when we get to the, the scene but it really strikes me how much this just becomes holly's novel at the end of it like we talked last week about how i was kind of very consciously aware of the holly gibney stuff and this this book this read i was really trying to focus in on like when did king fall in love with this character and why did this character so enrapture him and it it is like it's so funny approaching the book with that in mind just how much she just like takes over the story once she really starts to spread her wings in it um very deliberately that the the finale of the book the climax of the book bill hodges is sidelined and holly gibney takes over um and I really want to dive into that with you and, and talk about some fun, some fun theories I have. But uh, it was sure. kind of remarkable. Yeah, I, I imagine we'll get more into that later. But I agree with you. I think the most shocking thing to me is how well it works to suddenly change the focus, the change almost change the main character, change the point of view. Yeah. Uh, so close to the end of the novel, and then have that actually work out. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty, pretty yeah. uh, impressive. There is some risk there that you would you the reader would be frustrated by like the sidelining of your point of view character uh but 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 yeah i don't i didn't ever feel that way i wonder if other people do but i didn't yeah i didn't either okay matt uh let's get right into it we've got many 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 pages to cover this week uh we did have one really quick announcement before we did though uh we just wanted to let y'all know about a new podcast not one that we're making but one that i think will appeal to uh, some of our listeners that have participated. I, I don't know if, if you folks remember uh, the podcast Do the Right Thing. Uh, it was a podcast that uh, was on our network for a while. They wrote 30-minute short stories using a handful of words. Uh, they stopped podcasting. How long ago was it, Matt? A couple of years now? I think time has lost all meaning to me. I don't even know. I think it's been a couple of years, yeah. And, yeah. and they were... Uh, they were following on um, me, me and our friend Michael's podcast... Um, so-called writers which was a similar format uh, which we also couldn't keep up <laughs> so, so 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 here we are on the third leg of of this particular concept which is writing prompt podcast 
of 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 a similar design where in this particular case this podcast which is called you write and they operate under the subreddit uh, reddit.com slash r slash you write pod uh they are currently you know un- under uh what's the word uh, under sale let's go with that what? i'm reading moby dick so they're under full sale oh um <laughs> oh it's like a sailing okay a sailing. I, I gotcha you might get more sailing metaphors than usual out of me. I, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, but uh, they, they they have their uh, next week's words are posted on that subreddit and you can go check them and then you work those words into the story that you write in 30 minutes and you post the story and maybe they'll read your story on the podcast. Very cool concept. I l- I've always loved the concept. Uh, it was just too much work for us, but I'm mm. really glad somebody's carrying the torch. Yeah, I think um... – uh, a lot of our listeners are writers as well and, and like to participate in and do the right thing and and do the king thing, which I'm going to bring up here, acknowledging that we still have not completed that, Matt. Um, we've got two months, so. OK, let's get, get on that. Anyway, we'll, um, we'll do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the hosts is also named Matt, which is confusing, but also <laughs> uh, fitting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I've listened ah. to the first episode. I enjoy it. And uh, we thank you folks. If you're a writer and looking for a place to stretch those muscles and write some short stories, I think it's a fun little community there. So yeah, definitely go check that out. Yeah, you write pod on the Reddit. Yeah, and I think you can just type that in to any podcatcher and it should be there as well yep. if you want to if you want to just listen to it like I do because I don't write, as you know. I have a strict, a strict <laughs> rule against writing anything <laughs> oh. ever. It's a rule, is it? Okay. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's the only way to describe why I couldn't possibly have written a single word in the past six, seven years. Um, I didn't realize that. <laughs> All right, let's get into it, Matt. Let's uh, let's go kissing on the midway. How about it? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> we begin our final episode with Bill Hodges waking up and eating a nice unhealthy breakfast. I love the parenthetical quote here, Matt, where it says no one to watch his weight for now. Uh, it's so, so sad and immediately tone setting. Like, you know, we do this thing where we start and stop these books. Right. And so the first couple words or sentences of the first part of the the first chapter that we're reading each week has to like immediately get us back in the mindset of the book and i really found as i picked this book up again after taking a a few days off of it like this opening of him just being sad and like grumpily eating an unhealthy breakfast because eh, what's the point anymore just immediately got me back into the vibe that the book was going for yeah i agree um we're emphasizing what he had and what he has lost and how uh, both depressed and angry he is. I think over the course of this week's reading, he becomes increasingly sort of desperate yeah. um, and irrational in some regards, but we we understand all of it and we empathize mm-hmm. with it. Like this is one of those cases where we're not nece- we're not just shaking our heads in disapproval at how sort of rashly he's behaving. We're actually just like, yeah, man, I feel ya. Uh, Number one, because of what he's lost and how much it hurts, but also because of the reality that he needs to stop this guy. Yeah. And, and I think as we will see, um, Holly is just correct that <laughs> he needs to be the one to do it, right? So so we're able to overlook, I think, a lot of his rather chaotic behavior in this week's reading. Yeah, I mean, we certainly want him to be the one, but I think there are multiple times throughout the course of this chapter where he is kind of weighing the choices of continuing on on his own or going to the police where we're like, "Uh, maybe you should call Pete. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like perhaps next week when we talk about the whole book, we'll be doing a lot of armchair quarterbacking. Um, (laughs) But this week I'm going to do less armchair quarterbacking because I feel like the immediacy of the threat is, is sort of justifies a lot of, um, pedal to the metal type behavior here sure sure i mean and also just like generally we want to we want it to be bill which again is is why it's so ironic that at the end of the day it's not bill but we want it to be we want him to be the one that finds this guy we want him to be the one that takes him down we we have this this desire for revenge against this asshole that we've been forced to inhabit the head of for so many pages now so we're 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 with him in this yep i agree 
So Bill, thinking of how much more explosives Brady could possibly have, decides that today is the last day of his investigation. If he hasn't found Mr. Mercedes by 8 p.m., he's going to turn everything over to the cops. This is, of course, dripping Matt with dramatic irony because we know that the concert Brady is planning on blowing up is happening today, and it happens at 7 p.m., not 8 (laughs) p.m. So he's given himself a deadline that we know he will never actually meet uh, based on uh, how the events of the the, the book are going to unravel to us. Yeah, I got to say, this kind of stuff made me crazy, mostly in a good way. But uh, <laughs> j- just the, uh, like I said earlier, King uses every tool in the toolbox to amplify your anxiety about the ending mm-hmm. of this book. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is classic, just expert use of dramatic irony to just fuck with you emotionally. And yeah, totally. he keeps it up. He keeps it up. There's so yep. many instances of this in, in this this last chapter. Yep. Speaking of Pete, though, Matt, uh, he calls up Bill on the phone once again, giving him the opportunity to come clean and tell him what's going on. Bill, of course, declines again. And and I know, you know, we said we're not going to armchair quarterback him too much, but it is kind of fun to think right right in this moment. The reason why nothing bad happens at the end of this book to Bill or Jerome or Holly is because they win, right? If Brady had succeeded in blowing up the MAC... He's he being Bill is kind of fucked, right? Like, seriously. Yeah, yeah v- very much so. I actually was thinking <laughs> about this and, and and I looked into what he could be charged with. And, and I figure I'm not an expert in the law, but I figure he could be charged with one or more of obstruction of justice because of the withholding of evidence and mm-hmm. possibly interfering with and impeding an active investigation. Um Accessory after the fact, if you can make the case that his actions actually helped Brady avoid capture, which someone might try to make that case. Uh, mm-hmm. Interfering with the police investigation, obviously, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, there's also a, an antiquated one that no one ever gets charged with anymore called misprision of felony, which is knowing about a felony and failing to report it, which is a crime unto itself, which maybe he didn't actually do that because everybody already knew about the Mercedes killer. But anyway... I think on top well, of all that. They knew well, about the Mercedes killer. That they didn't know about Mrs. Hartsfeld, right? That's true. That's true. So he he does, he, the stuff he does this week actually makes his problem even worse for sure. So uh, I agree with that. And, and I, on top of all that, I would say that the fact that he was a former police officer is probably like an aggravating factor in all the above. Yeah. So he would be totally, totally boned if the Mac actually blew up. I'm going to call it the Mac repeatedly because I feel like every town has a, has a MAC and we call ours the Mac. Okay. So I didn't know what was the audio book calling it the, the Mac or the MAC. I think they called it the MAC. I don't remember. See <laughs> our, our MAC just happens to have the same, uh, uh, acronym as this one. And we call it the Mac. So I'm going to call it the Mac. I don't think I have a Mac. I need to look around. I don't think there's a Mac here. You might not. You might have left out some other kind of something AC. Yeah. You might have a. a, I technically live in. I technically live in Dallas, so I definitely have some sort of AC, but I don't exactly know what it's called. But if you type in Mac into your Google Maps bar, it'll just be like, "Yeah, you got a Mac. It's one mile away." All right, we're doing it. We're doing it live. Don't worry, we're not going to cut any of the delay out of this, so everyone has to... All right, we got Mac Cosmetics. Okay, that's not that's not what I was... Just a lot of cosmetic stores, <laughs> Matt. Well, there you go. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> the Richardson, oh, wait, the Richardson says, MAC. It says it's a sports club, though. There you go. See, my, ours ours is a, is a sporting sports center, activity center type place. Wow, incredible. Oh incredible yeah. max there the world go. over this was the most valuable way to spend our time on this incredibly lengthy episode we have to cover i'm glad we did this <laughs> yeah me too this. me too <laughs> all right so matt uh he he bill uh closed this conversation by saying this read my lips not hiding anything silence from the other end pete is waiting for hodges to grow uncomfortable and break it for the moment forgetting who taught him that trick so I really want to try, Matt, not to be like too harsh on Bill here um, for, for many reasons, one of which is that our characters win and nothing bad happens. So, you know, 
why be mean to him. But the thought did occur to me, and I couldn't help it as it occurred to me this week when I was reading this part. Bill mentioned last week that his mentor in the police department, his detective mentor, taught him to never call the victims in his cases Vicks, right? The Vic, you know, call them by their name, their people, remember them as people, remember them by their name, always remember them. This is a lesson that we saw last week specifically that Pete Huntley did not learn. He calls Jody or J- J- Janie, Janie, Jesus, uh, the <laughs> Vic. Um, and that got me thinking, well, who's Pete's mentor? Because like, This sentence made me think, forgetting who taught him that trick, was like, obviously, Bill has been Pete's partner for a long time. Bill is older than Pete. He seems to be slotted in that mentor position. So maybe the failure here, Bill, is you didn't teach Pete how to be a better detective, actually. Yeah, maybe so. I I, I agree. We don't want to be too hard on on Bill. But I, I do think just based on everything we know about Bill Hodges, it's fair to say that one of his flaws is that he's not a very personable person. Like, he's a he's a good person. He's a Mm -hmm. moral person. He was probably a great partner in many ways, like mainly ways relating to catching criminals. But he was probably not the most like personally inspiring and, and, you know, motivating person to work with. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's probably a fair guess. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right there. And and I like I like that this wasn't focused on, right? But it, I think it's it's true. Like the difference between Pete and Bill ha- have been highlighted uh, multiple times throughout the course of the novel. And I think it is just true, like objectively true at this point that that Bill is just clearly a better detective. He's better at this job than Pete is. Um, but I think he he has some responsibility for Pete in a little bit in in little ways. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Jerome comes over and offers to drive Bill around today since, you know, this car all blowed up. I I love that he kind of just momentarily forgot that fact. (laughs) Just, it's, 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 it's more cutting at the fact, oh yeah, this all just happened yesterday and I still haven't fully processed it. Sure. Yeah. It's, it feels realistic that, Mm -hmm. um, and also it kind of just reminds you of the way that a a traumatic event hits you where you, you fully processed is exactly the right term like he mm-hmm. he he hasn't integrated this knowledge into his life yet yeah and and holly's mom also calls uh and proves once again that she is just the fucking worst man <laughs> like yeah. she has this conversation where she's basically like what do i do what do i do with this body they're gonna ask me what to do what do i do and like just come on man <laughs> it's your it's your niece i don't know yeah. figure it out um yeah. This and then even, she asks yeah. about her will, right? She asks about her will. Fuck this woman. Seriously. Yeah. This is even lower than I expected. Yeah. She's the absolute worst. And that, I mean, we, we're going we're gonna to talk about Holly a lot this week. Um, but the responsibility of why Holly is the way she is, I think, is becoming clearer and clearer, which, as you, I think you pointed out last week, lines up perfectly with, with Brady Hartsfeld. They are, if, in many ways, foils of each other. Yeah, it's really. I, I think one fun thing about the book is how the character, the, the book rather, really plays with the idea of foils, where we've got several characters who are sort of foils of each other in different ways, or or yeah, overlap, true. or or contrast with each other in different ways, um, in a way that feels very fun and dynamic. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, that's another thing about this book that I appreciate. I agree. From here, we cut over to Brady preparing for his final day. Matt, we talked last week about how Brady absolutely blamed himself for the death of his brother, despite, you know, a large amount of evidence showing that the blame rests mostly with his mother. And with that in mind, I wanted to talk about this passage. Even if the vengeful god of the televangelists and child molesting black robes did exist, how could that thunderbolt thrower possibly blame Brady for the things he'd done? Did Brady Hartsfield grab his father's hand and wrap it around the live power line that electrocuted him? No. Did he shove that apple slice down Frankie's throat? No. Was he the one who talked on and on about how the money was going to run out and they'd end up living in a homeless shelter? No. Did he cook up a poison hamburger and say, eat this, ma? It's delicious. Can he be blamed for striking out at a world that has made him what he is? Brady thinks not. So Matt, after this, does this change? what we think about Brady at all? I mean, I think it changes it back to the way it was before. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Because I think, you know, last week 
we we came closer to just being like, oh man, I feel bad for this guy. And then this week's reading does a lot to be like, nah, don't, not, not so fast. Uh, <laughs> this guy sucks actually. And also it reminds me a lot of what we talked about previously regarding Janice, um, whose, whose name you might've forgotten, but that was the woman with the baby who got run over by mm -hmm. Brady. Uh, uh, and Hodges, obviously also both people who take responsibility for everything, even stuff that maybe has nothing to do with them. Yeah. And, you know, I think this is being put forth as a positive quality, the quality of a good person, someone who takes responsibility. And, you know, this is in stark contrast to Brady, who in this exact paragraph that you've quoted refuses to take any responsibility for even the things uh, that he is in direct control of, which is, yeah. you know, what one of the many things that makes him monstrous. I think you're so right here. A absolutely. I also think like part of this is just Brady bullshit to me like i think he does actually think frankie was his fault and has and harbors a lot of guilt over what he did to his brother um but that is irrelevant in that he has decided at this point that none of it's his fault none of it's his responsibility everything is is external to me it's it's like the final like i, I think you're absolutely right that last week like it's not that we were saying none of this is your fault brady but we understand why he is the way he is now um but that doesn't excuse this kind of behavior and i think you're right in in defining the difference between a good and a bad person someone willing to say hey that that's on me um is is clearly a, a distinction that this book is drawing and yeah even at the end of this whole thing um i think it is interesting that the one thing he left off this list was the actual murder of his brother right like mm -hmm. is it his fault his dad died is it his fault that frankie choked is it it like he doesn't go on to say like he says that she was the one that talked about how we were going to end up on the street but like he just he just very very specifically avoids and she was the one that nodded at me when i pushed him down the stairs right you know it's just like it's more brady bullshit man that's just yeah. what it is yeah totally um i agree uh, uh, just uh, i guess kind of an aside here it's interesting we haven't said i don't think we've talked like a for a single second maybe about the supernatural in this um in this book because mm. it's not really a thing in this book right uh at least yeah i, I don't think it is i haven't <laughs> i haven't <laughs> noticed anything supernatural in this book and and so i'm just thinking uh, at the metaphorical level like the way king usually uses the supernatural would be like it's not that the crimson king you know, inhabits Brady Hartsfeld and makes him blow up the Mac. It's, it's, but, but Max, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Brady's like abdication of responsibility is what like opens up a space for evil to sort of come in and, and play it, play out its role. Sure. So I, I'm not even necessarily speaking about it being supernatural. I'm more saying like that's, if King were going to have a supernatural element here, that would kind of be his normal path for doing it. I, I think, um, just the thought I had. Yeah, I, I like that. So I mean, kind of a tangent, but you've reached the end of the book now. There was no explicitly supernatural elements to it at all. Were you ever expecting them to make an appearance or was kind of the hard boiled like frame of this story enough to kind of make you go, oh, yeah, that's kind of what I thought was going to happen. I mean, I mean, I'm sort of always open to the possibility that some random person will have the shine <laughs> and, 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 and I'm literally open to the idea that Holly might have a little twinkle of it or, or that Bill Hodges <laughs> might for that matter. But like, sure. I just think, I think what King is doing with the story is just not going to be like, it, it kind of sucks all the fun out of the idea of a detective story. If it's like, and then they just knew magically because of sure. magic. Um, so I, I think even, <laughs> uh, even, uh, black house which, you know, is a detective story where there is the supernatural. I think they avoid, uh, the, the, the book is at its best when it's avoiding the supernatural, I think, in that particular book anyway. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there probably was reason to suspect maybe we'd go that way. It's like King's version of Hard Boiled is going to do everything, but also the psychic. Uh, but uh, no, we did not go there. Um, so ultimately the correct decision i think but yeah. uh but yeah fun to think about yeah 
So we're back with Bill. He has Jerome call vigilant security guard ser- services pretending to be a paralegal for Olivia Trelawney's law, law firm uh, to basically this is all to get a hold of our friendly security guard named Radney Peoples again. And we do. And then bing, bang, boom. Suddenly we have Brady Hartsfeld's name. This, this happens very quickly, right? It's just like boom, boom, boom. Uh, and then we have uh, Discount Electronics. And then we have Brady Hartsfeld is is now a name that Bill Hodges has heard for the first time. Yeah, it's a great moment. Um, it, it's sort of like unceremonious, but we're like standing up shouting, being like, it's him, yeah. it's him. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it is also kind of an interesting moment in Jerome's arc, which I think this book actually ultimately, in my opinion, does a pretty good job of giving Jerome a really interesting arc throughout the story because he is this character that we established at the very beginning of the, having these identity issues and he is kind of continually asked especially in this chapter to take on the mantle of another identity uh usually of a person older than he is uh and here we see he's he's he has the voice of an older person we're told and so he's Im- impersonating a professional a paralegal uh to get this information yeah, we're doing so much interesting stuff with Jerome this week. Um, this is just the first of many moments where we, we're we taking advantage of, of his voice, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And that helps with his identity crisis because many people would say his voice does not match uh, his face. And yeah. and I think that is part of that is part of what he's struggling with is, is society's expectations for him versus what he feels like he is. And so having to be put in the situations where he is – uh, <laughs> he is getting to flex certain muscles in certain ways. I think it's just really, really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, when we get to the the hacking of the control room, I think that is the one that it becomes the most profound to me. Um, but I, I love it all. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. So Bill grabs his old expired police ID, his gun, his happy slapper, and a small flat leather case that the book is oddly secretive about. Uh, it's just it's just his lock picks. It's just I don't know why it just didn't say he also grabbed his lock picks, but it doesn't. We only learn that later. Uh, Bill is on a mission now and clearly no longer caring about the legality of of anything. Right. Like just the idea of that. He's going to take his now expired, not active duty police officer's badge and um, impersonate an active duty police officer is a big, big, big no, no. And he's yeah. not worried about that anymore serious crime and he's just fully committing crimes now not even bothering to construct a narrative in his mind where it's okay he's just this is just about revenge now it's not it's not about catching i mean we we know this it's not about catching brady hartsfield it's about killing him so yeah why do you think the book was kind of like secretive sort of about the small flat leather case that just has the lock picks in it i don't have a clue man i mean it's not like it's a huge twist that he has lock picks right yeah, I mean, uh, it literally just resolves like a dozen pages later where he's like, and he brought out the small flat leather case that had lockpicks in it. I, it's just one of those, I guess, maybe pique your interests uh, and and pay off later moments. I don't, It didn't feel necessary to me. Yeah, I, I feel so. OK, a little bit ago, I said that King uses every tool in the toolbox for better or worse. And this is the kind of thing where I feel like he <laughs> he is actually going ham on the idea of like i'm gonna make them so nervous <laughs> that they're gonna they're gonna freak out and this is i think this is like an example of that where it's not even necessary that, that you withhold this from us it's just another thing that can kind of be hidden and thus create a sense of tension you know mm-hmm yeah i think that's a great point and and i think it also ties into kind of our next scene where we go back to Brady and we see that the mysterious large object that uh, Brady had bought for his plan is just a wheelchair. And I I think it's so funny how the book just like how nonchalantly the book drops that information as if it wasn't something that it was intentionally. And, and as we said last week, kind of awkwardly withholding, it's just like Brady got the wheelchair out. It was like, wait, <laughs> there's a, Oh, it was a wheelchair, and and we kind of slowly learned that his plan here is to pose as as a wheelchair bound person. Uh, he's hidden ball bearings and the explosives in the in the wheelchair, and that's how he's going to get through security. Uh, and he's also has he has brought the picture of Frankie with him that he will use as part of this whole thing. But I, I just, why did we do it this way? Is my question to you. You know, 
now that we're at this moment, I actually kind of appreciate like the feeling of sick dread that lodged in my stomach when he pulls out the wheelchair because it's a really good plan. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh shit, this is going to work, isn't it? He's going to get a huge amount of explosives into the venue. And that, another thing is like the book, because the book has been going so hard into the the tension and dread, I was like, oh, something horrible is going to happen. Like we, we, the book has successfully hoodwinked me into thinking that maybe this was going to have some horribly sad ending. Um, and saving the reveal of the wheelchair to the, until this moment was sort of j- just piling on the like, Oh no, Brady's plan is actually really good. And the good guys are so far behind in catching him. He's, he's, he's preparing to go into the venue and they don't even know that he is planning to blow any place up. Like, mm-hmm. I, I just want to, like, I just want to calibrate where we are, right? We're, we're doing the thing where we're going to start pretty soon flashing back and forth between the two two plot lines but like at this point in time brady seems just miles ahead of them and you're just like yeah. oh, oh 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 shet how are they going to catch up you know yeah i know I, I you're not wrong i think you have a really fantastic point there that that holding it until this moment really does nail you with the i i think you're <clears throat> It is true that a lot of what the book has done up until this point is kind of made Brady seem pretty incompetent at times. Like, uh, yes, he did get a bomb into Bill's car, which is pretty good, but he failed to kill Bill. Right. So mm-hmm. um, he also accidentally killed his mother um, and he he comes off most of the times as, as a whiny, petulant moron. Um, mm-hmm. But we need to not completely reverse that but we need to make sure that his threat and the danger he poses as we go into these final moments is real and there for the tension of everything you're talking about to pay off so doing this in a reveal allows us i think you're right to have that that moment of oh uh oh yeah uh oh oh yeah um and I think I think you're right. It works that way. I, I wonder, you know, not to be overly critical, but if there's a way to do that without kind of because because the the reveal of it being a wheelchair doesn't isn't the part that bothers me. The part that actually bothered me was how we kind of clunkily wrote around the wheelchair in the earlier scenes in order to hold it for this reveal. So I wonder if there's a way to do that and still get this moment without a little bit of the clunkiness of he took the object out of his yeah. car and stacked <laughs> the object next on the wall next to the house you know yeah yeah i don't know um I, I i agree with your point that last week i felt that was clunky and this week i feel like the reveal is actually quite effective and sure. so i i share your your feeling like maybe there was some other way this could have been done where i wouldn't have had that initial hesitation um mm-hmm. it's an interesting yeah. thought you know yeah i know uh Regardless, uh, we we now see Bill and Jerome get over to Discount Electronics. And Matt, who do they find waiting for them there? But Holly Gibney, who has cracked the case way before them with way less resources. Uh, Honestly, Matt, the the alternate title of this chapter could just be The Rise of Holly Gibney, right? Um, We'll talk about it more as we get to the end of the novel. But we do get to see here like a preview of how clever and resourceful and smart she is about all this stuff and it doesn't stop at this this moment the the rise of holly gibney not the dawn of holly gibney oh my shut up that, that's a that's no one's gonna get that <laughs> if they haven't been listening it's to the doofcast not beneath the planet of holly gibney <laughs> anyway oh I love on the doofcast we're talking about planet of the apes that was the joke okay yeah um, with the most convoluted title love the series the titles man i yeah i like that it's just not like planet of the apes 2 but it's also impossible it's yeah it's very it's it's delightful that we're having a lot of fun anyway yes um yeah like this moment in the story where holly comes back in it feels like a major f- fork in in what might have been right in the <laughs> in, in the levels of the tower that we're that we're uh, perusing because holly you know she's this tertiary character who dipped into the story previously but there was no particular reason to think she would become immensely important yeah there was certainly no reason to think she would almost take over as the protagonist in the last few tens of pages but from this point on, the story is just on a completely different track because of her presence. Yeah, and you just have to believe that 
this wasn't the plan from mm. a, a, a a writing perspective, right? Like, like he wrote this character and maybe he had a fun idea for a character, but I, I just, I have trouble believing that the plan from this, from, from the beginning was, and then this character is going to like become a huge part of my book, but it's very clear that she grabbed him. She grabbed him right away. And the, the, the story ends up kind of, transforming around her in a very specific fascinating way i mean like I, this this is so fun matt because again the first time i read this i wasn't thinking about this and it's just knowing what we know knowing that that there's a holly book that came out last year and another holly book coming out in the future like it, this 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 character has completely taken over stephen king in like in his mind and and you can watch it happen here you can literally page by page watch it happen like even the introduction of holly she's just this kind of quiet side character right yeah. um kind of kind of a little bit weird a little bit mysterious and then like the first time she opens her mouth everyone's like oh huh and like you could just feel king do that too as he's writing a town going uh-huh. oh Oh, maybe there's something more here. And he just keeps digging at it and poking at it and prodding and, and exploring. And and she she blossoms. And yeah. it's 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 kind of incredible to see. It's so funny to me that he first introduces her as a spinster, which is yeah. the most unflattering description. Uh, and then, like you said, completely takes over. Yeah. I, I think it I think it makes sense. Like, because I think we're just I think we're just right that Holly is meant to be a foil to Brady uh, because it's like, this is a person who had every disadvantage in life in many of the same ways that Brady did not identical ways, but sort of tonally and thematically similar ways, but she chose not to be a horrible piece of shit about it. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and so it doesn't surprise me that she had an important role in things, but it's like the, the level of importance is, is what is surprising to me. Yeah. And I will say like one of the things that I think King always does very well is even if even if something wasn't planned from the beginning, I do think he finds a way to wrap it into the overarching themes and ideas. And the other thing that I love about Holly and, you know, that that calling of describing her as a spinster early in the book, this is this is also a story about perception and the way you respond to people based on what you believe about them. Right. People. Mm, Yeah. Bill Bill first sees Holly and he doesn't think much of her and he's wrong and Bill is a good enough person that recognizes that he's wrong and uh you know because he did the same thing to Olivia and and that's that's how that ended up and that is definitely something that the story is exploring um it's with, a good with point, many yeah. of its characters I mean even Brady on like talk about foil Brady's on the other side of that like he he comes off as this personable friendly you know gregarious guy and he's not <laughs> So it's just like the way we read people, the way we look at people and decide who they are and who they aren't. Um, and, and the truth of that is, is underneath it all. I like that. All right. So Bill heads into the store and after talking with both Freddie and Frobisher, which writing those two names down back to back, Matt, made me realize there's a lot of people in Brady's life that have names similar to Frankie. Now, I don't know if this is an accident or not, but both Freddy and Frobisher are both close to Frankie. And I don't know if that's like <laughs> a, a, a thing that says something about the character or a thing that, that the author inadvertently did or just intentionally did it as a way of like, you know, hitting these beats of these similar sounding names, like subconsciously. I don't know. What do you think? I just noticed it. And I was mm. like, what, what does this mean? Yeah, I don't think I noticed it. But now that you've pointed it out, I think the level on which I'm going to choose to interpret it is that uh, Brady's being haunted by his brother. <laughs> I also really like Deborah and Barbara. Yeah, uh, like I don't yeah. know what's going on here. Yeah, no, no, you, you're, it's got it's got all these R R A sounds, right? It's mm-hmm. I, I like maybe it's okay. Our our thesis is everything is intentional, right? So. <laughs> So yes. this was definitely intentional. And furthermore, <laughs> like I, I just like the idea that that his his life is surrounded by these hints of this thing that he regrets, this this ghost from his past. I'm not saying that Frankie is literally haunting him as a ghost. I'm saying he he is haunted by what happened and what he did, and this dominates his life. And so yeah. 
that that's why he's surrounded by these names that are sort of echoes of Frankie. Yeah. No, I like that. I like that. I, I also really enjoy how like he goes into the store unsure exactly of which of the three of them Mr. Mercedes is. Uh, he's pretty sure it's not the woman because he, he's his profile has a, a man listed here and not a woman, but he's not 100 percent sure that it couldn't be Freddie. Um, but like he basically like immediately finds it out because both of them are like, yeah, Brady It's really weird about his mom. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the thing about him that they yeah. they clock and it's like perfectly fits into his profile. It's like, yeah, it's probably he's probably dealing with his mom because he's like really weird about his mom. <laughs> it's just like like sometimes you don't get gifted clues this good. And it's just like, OK, so it's him. There we go. Dec- decision made. It's yeah. this one. Yeah, I think at this point, the book doesn't want to spend a lot of time with the characters dawdling about this particular question because that would have been yeah. frustrating and not in a fun way. Now that we're at this point, we're kind yeah, of ready yeah. for them to to start zooming in on our guy. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, but while Bill heads into the store, something is happening on the outside, Matt. Jerome notices that Holly is driving around the mercedes what what's what's your reaction to this well i guess first of all it was funny because holly doesn't really see what the big deal is <laughs> yeah, um yeah which which ma- makes us like her actually but also it's poetic because it's like it's the mercedes but the mercedes is now providing holly with the ride that she needs to actually help catch the mercedes killer so that's a cool um you know po- poetic justice is what that is yeah yeah and ultimately we see the car kind of becomes a symbol of holly's transformation as well and perhaps you know holly has a a stand-in for olivia trelawney uh, as i think the book wants her to be um kind of showing her move past it uh with with the blue mercedes at the end so yeah i I agree it is it is really funny jerome's reaction though it's like and holly's just like what it's a car (laughs) what do i needed a car yeah it's it's very fun so holly suggests getting frogert and okay matt this was like an extremely 2010s thing. Do you remember this? Do you remember this time in our lives where like frozen yogurt became like the big trendy treat of the world and like froyo places were popping up all over the place? Yeah, I do remember. Well, yeah, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I remember there being like m- multiple of them on the same strip mall and it being just a little out of control. Yeah, it it was um, around this time. It was it was probably very very late two thousands, very early twenty tens that it, this thing really, really <laughs> went yeah. nuts. Um, yeah. I also, just, it's so funny because it's like, no, it's healthy. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's it's healthy. Err. Uh huh. But when <laughs> that and, ice cream, and then and then you've got the toppings, which equate yeah. to just like eating several boxes of candy. Yes. Um, yes. I'm pretty sure it was called Froyo though, and not Frogert. So my point here is just like, I don't know if like this is a, a a regional thing or King not knowing or just like Holly being Holly and not actually knowing the trendy name for a thing. So I, I yeah. don't know. What do you think? I, I thought Frogert was a thing, and the reason I say that is, um, the Frogert is also cursed. Um, from uh, the Simpsons Halloween special with the monkey paw. <laughs> Well, I think I think Froger, like, yes, I think there was that was a term used at some point to talk about frozen yogurt. But okay. like when it became like a super trendy thing in the 2010s, I see. I think people were calling it Froyo. OK, yeah. You know and Holly I mean. wouldn't Holly wouldn't do that. So, yeah, maybe. It's good characterization yeah. right there. I do. I like it. I like it. I also like it was a type of thing where I think me and my friends originally called it froyo ironically because we thought it was like a stupid name uh-huh. and it was like the thing where you call something something ironically for so long you actually just start calling it that uh, right which is just a horrible thing that we do but uh, and by we i mean with me i, I did that i did yeah. that i think that's the way language always evolves though <laughs> yeah on god no cap <laughs> no cap man no cap <laughs> Uh, the important thing here, though, Matt, is that this finally clicks things. It's not for Bill. You know, maybe we expected Bill to finally remember the ice cream man, but it's for Jerome, who was the one who was actually served ice cream by Brady Hartsfeld. And he realizes that that Brady is the ice cream man. And I just loved this quote. The click in his head is so loud, he actually winces, which is not like a thing <laughs> that happens. And, and yet... 
And yet, it's like <laughs> the perfect way to describe this feeling, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I hate it when that happens. I hate it when I have an epiphany <laughs> that just makes me go, ouch, it's too loud. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, you're right, though. I, I love it despite that. And then we, uh, he rushes to tell Bill with the information he just learned, and we get this. I think this is really interesting, Matt. A terrible question surfaces in his mind, like one of the snakes always lying in wait for Pitfall Harry, which, by the way, that's like he saw that Freddie was like playing a pitfall esque game on her phone. And that's like a, I love when King like establishes something like that and then brings it back in a, a, a metaphor or a simile very quickly, which outside the context means nothing, but means everything in the moment. <laughs> Just complete side note. Love that. Love yeah. that so much. Yeah. Uh, if he had paid attention to Mrs. Melbourne, instead of dismissing her as a harmless crank, the way he and Pete dismissed Olivia Trelawney, would Janie still be alive? He doesn't think so but he's never going to know for sure. And he has an idea that the question will haunt a great many sleepless nights in the weeks and months to come. Maybe the years. Um, so I just, I just love this, you know, talking about taking responsibility and not taking responsibility. And he, he's, he's here again, like once again, I judged someone based off of, you know, very cursory information about them. And they, it turns out, it turns out they were correct in this one thing. Um, and I should have taken it perhaps a bit more seriously. Yeah. There's a lot this week about the regret of having missed something. Th yeah. This actually made me sort of get something about the idea of a detective and, and why they're so often portrayed as, you know, having horrible personal lives in fiction. Because mm -hmm. if your life, if your career is such that you know that if you were, if you just thought a little bit harder about the case then maybe you would figure it out and then you would save a life then you're just never going to stop thinking about it yeah you're going to yeah. be sitting there at the at the water park with your family with with you know s staring fixedly at the at the back of the person in front of you going through the evidence one more time just in case something occurs to you right and uh i it was something it was literally just after all of the detective fiction we've consumed in our lives and and movies we've watched, I feel like it was this week's reading that actually made me like put myself in that position and realize, <laughs> oh, I get it. That would be miserable <laughs> and that would absolutely alienate you from your loved ones. Yeah. Yeah, I think about this a lot with like any kind of job that is uh, important <laughs> uh -huh. versus versus my job of like, we've got to get that paperwork in. Um, which, which is not to say my job isn't important, but it's not important in, in the manner that these jobs are important. Right. And it's like, yeah. How, how do you, when you're, when you're investigating crimes, how do you switch off when you're, gosh, when you're a doctor, how do you switch off? Like the idea that like, when I go to work, I'm saving people. When I'm not at work, people are possibly not being saved. Like, yeah, I know there's other doctors, right? That, I mean, that's, that's how you have to handle it, right? You have to handle it. It's like someone is going to pick up my slack when I am not doing it. But yeah, that is a, that is a calculus that I, as a, as a corporate drone, <laughs> don't have to make because, yeah. you know, if, if I miss a day of work, like everything's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess one way to think about it for, for us office drones is like sometimes you're under a deadline and when you're under a deadline, it becomes very obvious to you that like, well, the more I work on this, the faster it'll get done because that's how time works. Mm -hmm. And and then you get really wrapped up in it because you're like, okay, well, I don't know how much longer it's going to take. So I'm just going to work as hard as I can until it's done. And hopefully that time is before the deadline. Yeah. Um, and when you're a detective, that's just everything all the time because the case, you always have more cases and every case is in some sense a amorphous deadline that instead of just knowing when the deadline is, it's just, well, maybe the killer will kill someone else and I haven't caught them. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, you're right. I'm very glad I didn't become a detective because I think I would have suffered this exact same fate for sure. Yes, me too. I'm glad <laughs> I did not become a detective. I think I just anecdotally uh -huh. would have been really good at it. Just saying. I of course caught i would have caught so many murderers because that's how uh being a detective works you're always in murder police and you're always catching catching them yeah you're always catching them yep and you wear a fedora and you're super cool uh-huh and that's it 
Has a real detective ever worn a fedora? I mean, obviously, like back when people just wore hats all the time, yes, but like since then. I don't know. Probably not. Do you think any of them did it ironically until it just like just like saying Froyo that it just like they did it ironically and then it became a thing and then they're just like the hat guy? I mean, there's got to be one of them out there, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of detectives out there. I'm sure one of them is right now wearing a fedora. They yeah. might even be listening to us. <laughs> they might. If you're a <laughs> if you're a murder detective wearing a fedora and you're listening right now, please send us an email and a picture um, ideally. And then follow-up question, why aren't you solving the murder right now? <laughs> you don't have this kind of free time. <laughs> All right. Uh, the three of them hop into the gray Mercedes and head over to Brady's house. And, and from here, Matt, the book does something really interesting. We cut over to like a couple of random beat cops in Lowtown. And it's this really interesting choice because this whole sequence plays out where, where they – just observe a guy walking out of a pawn shop and inadvertently early trigger an ATF bust because they notice he's got a fucking missile launcher in his hands. And you're just like, okay, what does this have to do with anything? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. It's only, it's only pages and pages later as Bill calls Pete to like finally say, okay, I'm going to hand the case over now. I'm stuck. I'm handing it over to the cops that we realize that the whole purpose of the scene was to set up the situation in which the cops are way, way, way too busy to help out with the Mr. Mercedes thing. But like in the moment, am, am I wrong here? You're just like, what is this? Yes. I had the same reaction of complete bafflement. Um, <laughs> I mean, it ultimately works out really well, but in the moment I was just, I didn't even know what to do with it. I, I kind of just put it out of my mind as soon as we were out of the scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's just, like, I'm not saying it's bad. Let's, let's be clear here. I, I enjoyed the sequence a lot, and I enjoy the way it pays off later, and we'll talk about that when we get to Bill's choice at that moment. But, yeah, it's it's, it's one of those things where, like, you're kind of daring your reader to to deal with it you know it's like i'm just going to do this thing for a few pages and you're just going to deal with it and i have confidence in my ability to to characterize these two random cops in the 11th hour as we're ramping up to the climax of our story that you're just going to be okay for with this little quick diversion even though i'm not going to explain to you why it's happening until until much later yeah well he's really good at this specific thing actually so Yeah. yeah this absolutely feels like like a choice by a guy who knows he's good at what he does and and understands his craft because i i just don't think a, a younger writer would have either made this choice or made it poorly yeah i agree so bill gets to brady's and breaks into the house he recognizes the smell of a rotting corpse immediately and quickly finds the dead deborah hartsfeld in her bed uh, i really love this line matt a second later jerome says i hope you know what you're doing I don't, he thinks as he checks the bathroom. I've lost my mind, and the only way to get it back is to let go of this. You know that. But he thinks of Janie giving him his new hat, his snappy private eye fedora, and he knows he can't. Won't. Ugh, I love the won't at the end there. Just like this admission of, no, 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 it's not can't. It's, it's I, I, I won't. I won't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I, I feel like it makes it more exciting in some sense knowing that hodges is aware that he's behaving irrationally yeah and and likely knowing that he's dragging these innocent people into this mess with him um i guess it's just if if he was doing it blindly and stupidly then that would be disappointing but him doing it on purpose feels more human in some way i i, I i'm struggling to articulate what it is that i like about this but uh, i really do like it Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think I'm trying to I'm trying to give you some articulation here and I'm struggling as well. Um, but I, I do think it is just this idea of like it. If you're watching a character like go off the deep end. It, it, it is more satisfying and perhaps a bit more comforting if they if they acknowledge it, if they realize it, like mm-hmm. I think the comfort is there, like. I don't think we actually believe Bill will go too far, right? And yeah. it's, it's like the, it, it's like the, if you if you know or you if you think you're crazy, you're not, you're not as crazy, right? Like that's not entirely correct, but, um, 
just the idea of that I think is interesting. Yeah, I, I think I think we just fundamentally want our characters to have self awareness and a character, yeah. two characters who make the same choices, one of whom is self aware and one of whom is not, uh, feel very very different to us. Mm-hmm. So they find nothing else in Brady's house um, except for their big uh, Brady's big. Uh, uh, command center uh but they can't figure out the computer passwords and i just wanted to point this at they think to like track holly's kind of transformation over the course of this chapter maybe that maybe he's voice act voice what holly just asks voice activated command jerome tells him brady says milk duds or underwear and the countdown stops holly giggles through her fingers then gives jerome a timid push on the shoulder you're silly she says like that's amazing <laughs> like the, just watching her she's like giddy with excitement and and with happiness and i think bill kind of breaks it down for us a little bit later but like she's just getting to do all the stuff and getting to be part of this group and getting to go all that like she's ecstatic like and, and it's almost like it almost feels odd in how it just compares and contrasts with the emotions of all the scenes we're going through where like brady is getting closer and closer to getting inside the the mac like this this is going to be bad and 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 they don't even know it yet and yet like holly is just like having the time of her life yeah i think this is one of the things king is always aware of is is balancing the tone where we're really things very intense things are very dark we're in a very sad part of the book so we really do need something kind of light and heartwarming Mm -hmm. and what what we have here is this thread of holly and jerome's budding friendship uh keeps keeps this all from becoming a completely dread laden and humorless slog yeah no that's that's a good point we need we need this levity i think and, and holly is is happy to give it to us right, right. so the trail running cold again and bill aware that brady might be out there planning his last hurrah he sits down and starts mentally and emotionally preparing to let the case go and hand it over to pete holly for her part is absolutely distraught at this idea that he, he cannot do this. This is this is this is his case. This is their case that they that he is the only one who can solve this thing and he can't do this. Matt, what, what do you think in this moment? I mean, I think in this moment, she's, she's probably right. Um, and this was one of the few moments in the story where I actually wondered if we were supposed to interpret this as a psychic premonition that hmm. she just she just knows that it has to be Hodges um in in the you know capital k sense of the word <laughs> sure. knows uh but um but um i mean and, and then later we'll find out that like yeah the police force is totally distracted there's no way they can move on him in the stadium without causing tra- causing brady to trigger the bomb like th- there kind of was nothing else like in other words what happens in the story is essentially the best case scenario right so so holly's right and to me the question is why is she right like is she just is she Mm -hmm. right because she because she needs this and they just lucked out i don't know (laughs) what what do you think i mean do you think there's a do you think we're meant to think that holly is psychic and yeah no, I, I think Holly is very intuitive and knows that Bill is very good at his job. But I also believe Holly really, really needs this as well. And like like we talked about, she's giddy. She's happy. She's getting to be part of something. And, and uh, Bill says it just a little bit later. I think Hodges realized that if catching Mr. Mercedes is more important to anyone on Earth than it is to him, that person is Holly Gibney. Maybe for the first time in her life, she's doing something that matters and doing it with others who like and respect her. So, like, I I, I agree with you in that she's very intuitive and and perhaps realizes that Bill is just the smartest person for the job. But I also think even if that weren't true, that she would will it to be true because she wants to be part of this so much. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the the two of them are both making terrible decisions because they want to be the <laughs> ones who actually catch Brady. Yeah. So I do think it's a really interesting choice to do this whole thing where, oh, the police are actually like completely overwhelmed because it does kind of remove the choice from Bill, right? I mean, not entirely. He could have still very easily just told Pete, "Hey, I need to come clean with you about this Mister Mercedes stuff," and Pete probably would have just been like. Great, great to hear, bud. We'll talk about it tomorrow. I'm busy today. Um, 
but essentially like the the act of king making this big event happen that that makes all police in the area too busy for this event does just make the decision for bill in a lot of ways or gives him the exact out that he wanted to take after all right yeah well yeah and then it ends up being good that they did because there was no real yep. ticking clock element and now suddenly there is and then if they hadn't been you know in haste then they wouldn't have even figured out that brady's gonna bomb the place tonight so yeah they, they did luck out right that, that's mm-hmm. the truth um do you think we're making a commentary on the ability inability of authority to stop and prevent things like this I, 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 that might be a reach i'm just curious well to the extent that i was thinking on similar lines i was thinking about how much easier it is to break things than to protect things or to to fix things because you know we live in this society that's just very fragile Mm -hmm. and i think that is a thematic thread that runs throughout the book right like the, the 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 teeny bopper uh uh boy band event has very little in common with the job fair folks standing in line Mm-hmm. But like the thing that they do have in common is it's just g- gatherings of people that that sort of expose the inherent fragility of the way that we all live our lives, where we're always going to places and doing things where if someone were evil and wanted to hurt us, they could do so very easily. And... um the authorities would probably fail to stop them if they were committed to doing that. That's, I, I, I do, I do think there's a thread, there's a thematic thread throughout the book that concerns this. Yes. Yeah. No, I think you're onto something there. I want to, I want to circle back around to that next week for sure. And maybe spend some more time with it for sure. Okay, I cool. like that. All right. So, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we basically have Bill call Pete he gets the news about um, about the ATF raid, and um, he basically decides that he's not gonna he's not gonna give up the case just yet. And we do get this we do get this scene where he walks back and he sees Holly on the phone. And I did want to talk to you about this briefly. Um, Holly says, "I'm with Mr. Hodges and his friend Jerome." She says, "They're my friends, Mama. We had a nice lunch together. Now we're seeing some of the sights." And this evening, we're going to have a nice supper together. We're talking about Janie. I can do that if I want. Even in his confusion over the current situation and his continuing sadness about Janie, Hodges is cheered by the sound of Holly standing up to Aunt Charlotte. He can't be sure it's for the first time, but by the living God, it might be. Um, so again, once again, transformation of Holly, right? Like we're seeing her become this new and, and different person. Um, and... I want us to put a pin in this because I want to circle back around to this particular conversation and and Holly's relationship with her mother in just a little bit. So just keep this in mind, Matt. Okay. All right. I will. (laughs) So uh, they decide they're going to keep going, at least for the time being. They all three leave Brady's house, taking Deborah's laptop with them, hoping that perhaps there's something on it that that first they can crack it because she might not have as good of a password as Brady would. And, and that there's something on it that helps indicate, you know, what he's going to do next. Where is he? Any, any more information that they need. Uh, So they head back to Bill's house. So I think I missed like one sentence somewhere in here and I didn't realize that they had brought the laptop with them. And this led to me being just quite confused about where people were relative to each other for a period of time. (laughs) Eventually, eventually figured it all out. Um, and I'm not saying that I need to have my food chewed for me, but I, th- I honestly don't know how I missed it because it's not like I wasn't listening. In fact, I was listening quite intently because it's a super intense part of the book. I think it was like, I was so anxious that I was not like rendering the scene in my head the way I usually do. Mm-hmm. And I missed, and I missed this detail and it caused me to get really confused. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I'm 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 bothering to mention this because this sort of thing very rarely happens. Where I'm just like, what we have the the blah, and and then late, only later realize like, oh, it was that's they had the laptop. It's a laptop. They brought it with them. You know. Yeah, yeah. 
there she she just grabs it and bill's like yeah fine whatever do that and we learn later yeah. that holly also grabbed her pocketbook and on all her stuff with them too. <laughs> yeah because we're just we're just stealing from the dead now um it's great but yeah i know that yeah I, I i it's like a blink and you miss it scene it happens very very quickly so cool. okay. it happens yeah Meanwhile, Brady eats his last meal, a clucker delight with extra <laughs> gravy and coleslaw at the chicken coop. Just, <laughs> just, it's perfect. It's just perfect. Yeah. Well, so one thing that's perfect about it is it's like a child's idea of a perfect last meal, right? Yeah. Yeah. He eats it all too. Every little, every, every little bit. Yeah. Yep. So Brady thinks about how he'll be remembered forever, and then he leaves the debt ret one final message on Debbie's blue umbrella as an insurance policy. You know, it's just occurring to me that Debbie is short for Deborah, which is his mom's name, and that's the website he's been using. Interesting. There's also thought about that. No, I I didn't think of that at all. Um. Nope. Interesting. <laughs> interesting makes you think maybe he's the one that made the website and um, the umbrella is her dress yeah that's uh <laughs> that's a very creative leap there scott i love, I love it i love it <laughs> matt I, I think one thing I, I wanted to talk to you about here or at least to note is this final message that brady sends to bill is the first message brady has written bill since the book started that we don't get to read until bill reads it you know this is reversing the previous paradigm we talked about um i think this is interesting because in your mind does this perhaps indicate that mr mercedes might have the upper hand in the game they're playing right i think we talked about like the reason why we don't see any of bill's messages until they're read by brady is because bill is doing the hunting and so what matters is brady's reaction to the message not the message itself and i just it just feels like perhaps this in this moment that is a reversal of the paradigm and it is setting up that 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 uh, you know john doe has the upper hand here totally agree it feels like brady is ahead of them and it's 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 worrying to us um, that's one yeah. of the many notes like this that make us more and more worried mm-hmm so the message is so long, sucker. P.S. Enjoy your weekend. I know I will. This is trying to make Bill think that Brady is planning something for the weekend to come, not the day today itself. And it it works kind of right. Uh, when Jerome asks about the round here concert that night, Bill says eh, it's probably safe for your sister and mom to go to the concert. I, I love I love this line so much. Then Hodges says something that will haunt him for the rest of his life. If Hartsfield's as clever as I think he is, he won't be anywhere near the Mingo tonight. I think your mom and sis are good to go. If he does try crashing the concert, Larry's guys will have him before he gets in the door. Oh, Stephen. Oh, Steve. <laughs> oh, Matt, man. This is an interesting one, though, because, I mean, obviously nothing bad happens at the concert in the end, right? So the idea that this is going to haunt Bill for the rest of his life is like, okay, but it all works out kermit you know yeah. but in the moment this certainly makes us think something bad's gonna happen right this is one of those few times that i'm gonna say i don't like this because <laughs> it just made me go like oh so is is the this king just telling us that the bomb's gonna go off and kill his family <laughs> because that's the most straightforward interpretation of that and and it's not correct and so then when everything turns out well, you're, you're just like, I kind of feel like you, you, you duped me there in, in a way that felt a little unfair. Um, normally, I, I don't make statements of the form. I like this or, 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 or didn't like this specifically. Actually, I say I like things all the time, but I, I normally don't say I don't like things. I'm just like, oh, well, you know, that's a choice. This time, I just it just rubbed me the wrong way because um, I just felt tricked, you know. Yeah, no, that's fair, because the other thing he could be playing on is the idea that this will haunt him for the rest of his life and like a cheeky like, <laughs> which is only going to be the next two hours. Um, <laughs> that's true. But it's not playing on either of those things. Yeah, I, I feel like this is, you know, I, I think it's again because King has like so long done these moments where he just like tells you the stuff. Um, it's definitely him like knowing that you know that he's going to do that and faking you out in a way that, f that I agree feels a little cheap because ultimately like 
yeah, the, what what ultimately like what we have to have this interpretation as is that Hodges will feel a little bit guilty that he put these people in harm's way, despite the fact that it it ended up working out in the end and no one was hurt. Um, but yeah. he will harbor a little bit of guilt about that of his his recklessness, which yeah, yeah but like haunt him for the rest of his life is very specific language. Right. I, I agree, particularly with that latter point where the idea is, is he's meant to like, oh, it was almost so bad. They almost all yeah. died, um, but they, they they didn't. So yeah, that's I, I agree. It's um, a little, little awkward to me. Mm -hmm. So as Holly tries unsuccessfully to break into Debbie's blue computer and Jerome is looking for events that are occurring this weekend that would perhaps be targets of Brady. Bill has a time to like sit down and not do anything and think. Um, and, and I think Matt, it, it is really interesting that in this moment we get this maybe like first real look in, into Bill's relationship life pre-retirement. And, and I'm kind of in love with how King writes this section. So it says it was the coldness that first stole through the cracks in the marriage and finally froze it solid. It was how he shut her out, telling himself it was for her own good, because so much of what he did was nasty and depressing. How he made it clear in a dozen ways, some large, some small, that in the race between her and the job, Corinne Hodges always came in second. As for his daughter, well, geez, Allie never misses sending him a birthday and Christmas cards, although the Valentine's Day card stopped about 10 years ago, and she hardly ever misses the Saturday evening duty call. But she hasn't been, seen, been to see him in a couple of years, which really says all that needs saying about how he bitched up that relationship. So I just, I love how so much of this is written, Matt. I love it was the coldness that first stole through the cracks of the marriage and finally froze it. Love that. And I just love this kind of, accurate and fair reflection because you know we knew bill was divorced and we knew bill was not estranged but did not have the best relationship with his daughter but we kind of just were making the assumption it was like for cop reasons and it is ultimately for cop reasons but the bill is aware of those reasons i think matters yeah it's again it's that self-awareness i think that makes us appreciate him as a protagonist yeah yeah and and, and the the conclusion of this whole thing from a plot perspective is that Bill kind of realizes that if it was his daughter wanting to go to a concert at the MAC this, this evening, d convinced or not that Brady was not going to be there, he realizes that there's no way he would let her go. That even if uh, it was a small risk, that's still too much of a risk. And he walks out of the room and intending on telling Jerome that fact, call your mom and sister, tell him not to go to the concert, tell him it's not safe. But then Jerome calls him into the room and says he found something. Turns out on Saturday, there's a big career day at a local hotel. And everyone just kind of decides that this has got to be the place Brady's going to hit. It fits too perfectly. It's too it's it's circular in that his his instigating event and his his big bang event uh, coincide and, and ping off each other in this way. Um, and of course, that's wrong right like <laughs> brady doesn't even seem aware that this this thing is happening on saturday and I, i'm curious if what you think like if he did if he did know about that would he have picked it i don't know what do you think i no i don't think so so that's an interesting question i think the interesting thing here is that they make what feels like a reasonable deduction here where you know, they basically say, uh, you know, oh, so he he really likes mowing down people who are looking for a job. Maybe there's something to that. He hates jobs, um, <laughs> but like it's a red herring. He just wants list. to, yeah. he just wants to kill a lot of people, um, and like a, a big dramatic, uh, uh, you know, um, massacre is all he's after. It doesn't have to have anything to do with that one. So it, it's a thing where like, it's a plausible deduction, but it's the wrong deduction. And it, may, it this is another thing that drives us crazy, by the way, because we're, we're watching them make this incorrect deduction and our dramatic irony knowledge of what's actually going to happen is just making yeah. us scream at the characters. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think, I think you're ultimately right there. Um, and, and, and also the fact that he was almost going to tell him the thing, and then got distracted by this new information and then just never loops back to, oh, by the way, maybe tell your sister not to go because he just concludes, oh, this has got to be it. This has got to be it. It, it, it. it fits too perfectly. Um, yeah. I think it's I think it's giving Brady more credit than he deserves because you're right. Like 
it was not the job fair with the Mercedes because of any particular reason other than they were there. And that's kind of the concert tonight as well. It's like, yeah, there's no, no particular reason except that they're there because Brady doesn't really care about anything. Right. So despite them being sure when and where this whole thing is going to happen, Holly wants a little bit more time to work on the computer password and Bill gives her that. But even with that time, she still can't find the password. It's Bill actually that finally cracks it, realizing that honey boy is Deborah's pet name for her son. The password works in the computer. The on the computer, they find the voice codes for Brady's control center. Matt, I think this is pretty important that, you know, this idea we learn here that Deborah Hartsfeld was much more observant of her son than Brady truly believed. We kind of got a hint at that with, with, you know, she knew about his extra fridge with the the meat in it. And that, that ends up being her demise. But I, I love the comparison between Holly and Brady here. You know, once again, we talk about them as being foils, but both have parents that kind of know something isn't right with their kids. So they both keep a more watchful eye on them. And so Deborah has is fully aware he has these voice codes for his computers and 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 knows them, uh, even if she can't crack them herself because her voice is wrong. But this this is a fun thought, Matt, that I wanted to ask you here. Do you think that Deborah Hartsfeld might have suspected on any level that her son was the one responsible for the city center? Do you think maybe maybe even not a conscious level, maybe in her her deepest, darkest corners of her mind she feared that she knew something was wrong with her son and feared that he was the person that did this i think it's entirely plausible i don't know that there's like strong textual evidence but i really like the thought i think it's entirely possible that she might have feared it but never quite consciously articulated the thought i think it's also Mm -hmm. entirely possible that she did consciously articulate the thought and that's why she was listening to his computer passwords because she wanted to <laughs> maybe figure it out. Although even if she had figured it out, I don't know that she would have done anything about it. You know, I, yeah. I don't, I don't think she would have turned him in, but um, it's really, it's, it's fun to think about. It's fun to imagine like, well, she had, she had her own whole life just because she was an alcoholic who stayed around the house. Doesn't mean that she wasn't paying attention and, and uh, much more aware of his doings than he realized. Yes, um, agree. And I, I also think it's interesting the ways in which her kind of complete standoffish type of parenting uh, versus Charlotte Gibney's like incredibly possessive and owning type of parenting. And it's like, obviously, they're both like different examples of bad parenting right um but i I don't know there's something there i think like yeah like yeah i i I agree i mean we're we're examining all of the many ways in which you can be a dysfunctional parent sure Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so matt we get back to brady's house and jerome is the one who was able to approximate his voice enough to unlock his computers and just to to say state this again like the Jerome is a young black man with identity issues with, you know, like people look at him, they look at the color of his skin. They think he's going to talk a certain way. He's going to act a certain way. He's going to, to like certain things and dislike certain things. And he is forced to live in a world where people do that to him constantly. And now here he is impersonating an older white man uh, to, to get break the lock on a computer and i just find that like a just a fascinating wrinkle and fascinating visualization of the exact problems that that he's he's having in his life i don't know i just love that so yeah. much no that's great I'm, I'm glad i'm glad you keep drawing our attention to to this aspect of what's going on with jerome by the way because it, it it was something that i sort of enjoyed but more passively and, and unconsciously and less less explicitly mm-hmm. um but yeah, it's all totally there, and I yeah, I think we're right on the money in comparing Brady and uh, rather you know contrasting Brady and Jerome um, because here we have Jerome actually role playing Brady and doing so successfully. You know, it's because mm-hmm. of him they're able to break into the computer. So yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, it doesn't necessarily like 
solve <laughs> solve his identity crisis, but it is just a, a visualization of that crisis, I think. Yeah, yeah. So something to note here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time like actually as we go beat to beat, scene to scene, like cutting back and forth between all these moments. But as we start to sprint towards the climax of our novel, King is intercutting between Bill and his team uh, investigating uh, Brady and Brady's arrival and execution of his plan at, at the Mac. We even get to see a bit from Jerome's sister and mother as they arrive at the concert. And I do love this little detail of them seeing Brady in his wheelchair and kind of, you know, taking pity on him and, and, and having empathy and, and wanting to help him. And, and that is essentially what Brady is doing at this concert, right? Like by picking the disguise he has picked by putting himself in a wheelchair, by, you know, holding a, a picture of his dead brother. And as we see, eventually like claiming he's his son that loved this band and wanted to see it. And he's coming in his memory. He is essentially exploiting the kindness of strangers to hurt them. And that is ex especially despicable to me. And I do think it like, it just echoes the opening moments of this book to me if, as well, where we saw these people be kind to each other. We saw this, this random guy notice this woman was suffering with her baby and he was kind to her. And that choice is exploited by Brady ultimately by he is able to, kill them you know like i mean it may exploited in that instance is the wrong word but like we see brady you know take that and 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 destroy that and that's yeah. kind of what he's doing here again in a way yeah yeah it it, it feels very evil and it, it makes you feel sick to sort of juxtapose the the beauty and um um earnestness and mm -hmm. you know, open-hearted love of, of of these just normal people doing normal things with this absolute coldness and callousness and willingness, even eagerness to destroy that. It's genuinely upsetting and disturbing. And it's very much amplified by the fact that we do have these point of view shots from these these more normal characters. Yeah, I agree. There's also a thing about this concert I did want to discuss with you, <laughs> Matt. We talked about at the start of the novel about how King was clearly like taking a shot at trash TV with the way he describes both Bill and, and Deborah Hartsfeld's addiction to it early in the book. And we see here at the end through Brady's eyes, mind you, the kind of insane absurdity of boy band obsession. And Brady, of course, completely hates it. But I'm I'm wondering what you think like the book's stance on it is. Is this part of an ongoing like commentary on modern life or is the boy band stuff separate from it what do you think uh i mean i feel like to the extent that the book has an opinion or stephen king is showing his opinion through the book i think basically by showing this all through the eyes of jerome's sister um we we see that the attitude is like this is just harmless silliness let girls be girls this is, this is not the end of western civilization um, and it is in fact Brady who is the crazy asshole for thinking that it is, you know, bad. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I agree with that. I think ultimately this is not a type of music or a thing that Stephen King himself probably particularly likes, but I do like how he compared th through, through, um, Jerome and Barbara's mother, like we kind of get to see. Like, this is a thing that's always happened, right? Like, like she had her first band she went to, and then, you know, this is similar to Beatlemania. Like, this has been a thing for a long, long, long time. This is not something new and particularly bad. Although yeah. this band, like, clearly worse than the Beatles, right? I mean, like, yeah. just, come on, come on. Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah, I feel like he's more, like, gently ribbing and making fun of the concept yeah. of boy bands, whereas yeah. when, when it was, like, the... Judge Judy stuff in previous weeks that was pretty pointed and yeah. critical. That w yeah, that was no holds barred. I actually think this is trash and hurting the people <laughs> that that digest it constantly. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, so Jerome successfully unlocks the computers as they note the wild bunch screensavers all over them. You know, this was noted, I think, early in the novel when Brady first unlocks his computers himself. But I don't think we ever talked about the wild bunch, did we, Matt? Um, 
this is a, a, a 1969 Peck and Paul Western, which is like one of the greatest films of all time. Like objectively, it's a very, 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 very good movie. If you haven't seen the wild bunch, please, please go see the wild bunch. Matt, you've seen the wild bunch, right? Nope. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's on my uh, list though. Uh, I'm so, I can't, I'm so mad. I'm so mad. I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> God, you're just, your response to this is just, no, I, I know. I, under, I know. I yeah. Know. It's I, like, I accept it. It's like when your kids are throwing tantrums. That's just, just what you, that's how you handle me in these moments. It's yeah. just when your kids throw, it's, no, I understand. You have yeah. a lot of feelings right now yeah. and it's, it's okay to have feelings. Yeah. Poor, yeah. poor, poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking watch the wild bunch. Um, I, I, I just like, <laughs> Holly points this out immediately because Holly loves movies, right? And this is, by the way, one of the many, many reasons why I love Holly Gibney is because Holly is, is a movie buff and she really loves them. I do think this is pretty fitting that this is Brady's favorite movie, though, because this is a notoriously violent film. Like when this movie came out, people were shocked and horrified by the level of violence in it. Holly here says it gave her nightmares, which is I feel like if you'd ask Peckinpah, that's the reaction he wanted like he wanted incredibly brutal violence not to make people go cool but to horrify people um that's like one of the big points of the film and i nothing in the book ever says this but i i I feel like it's safe to say that brady loves this movie for the exact wrong reason i mean you know no wrong way to watch a movie but you know sometimes there is and i i feel like brady hartsfeld's appreciation for the wild bunch which he does call his favorite movie um early in the book uh, is for for because he sucks. Yeah, absolutely. This <laughs> this is uh, perfectly in character with him to uh, mm-hmm. to watch movies as you know a twelve year old boy would. Yeah. Yes. Um. So there's also this one part where as they're working on the computers, Bill goes over and sits in the corner, and as he does, he rubs absently at the hollow just below his left collarbone. That annoying pain is back. So I'm guessing the answer to the question is yes, but did you immediately go, oh, no, it's a heart attack? Uh, yes, I did immediately go, oh, no, he's having a heart attack, but, which as bad as everything is going, you're just like, oh, oh, oh come on. <laughs> um, you, I mean, really, this the end of this book does a great job of just making you feel like this is totally hopeless. There's like no way yeah. the heroes are going to be able to get out of this. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, and this is just like one more thing on top of it all. I think it is funny that like just in story speak, like pain in left arm is just like heart attack. Like you don't you don't you have to say like obviously it, the, the book will eventually say it textually later as when Brady informs or when uh, Bill informs everyone he's having a heart attack. But in this moment, I think every person reading just went. Yeah. Oh, right. No. The the book does a good job, I think, like being in Bill's head where it's obvious that he's aware that he's having a heart attack and you, the reader, yeah. are aware that he's having a heart attack, but he never like quite thinks it. And then mm-hmm. and then finally there's the moment where he's just like, I can't go. And they're like, why? And he's like, because I'm having a heart attack. Because <laughs> I am actively right now having a heart attack. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Um. So on Brady's computer, the team finds well, sexy sexy pictures of his mom <laughs> that she posed for uh-huh what oh that's it's good stuff man <laughs> this book goes places well i i don't know what like <laughs> i'm just imagining the photo shoot and it's just the most the most disgusting thing yeah well don't do that man you gotta well, you gotta yeah no well Okay, now, I, now I'm imagining the photo shoot. <laughs> now everyone is. That's yeah. the, that's the enduring thing you're going to take away from this book is yeah. that that moment right that's there. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate uh-huh. you. Yeah. Uh, but somehow, Matt, even worse than that news, if you can believe it, is the news that Brady has clearly targeted the Mac and tonight's concert for his attack. Oops, oops, we fucked up. We made a mistake. Oh no. Yeah, and I think Jerome's reaction here is the the best the most wonderful slash horrible moment yeah. of of the book possibly where you know 
it's inc- it's extremely human and it also reminds you that he's just a kid. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Bill has been putting a lot on this kid and he's been so heavily involved in all this. I think it is great that in this moment we we do get to step back and realize that oh, yeah, you know, he is a child still and holy shit, he's yeah. suddenly terrified. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So from here, the chase is on, and the next 25 pages or so fly by really, really quickly as Bill and his team kind of like frantically try to get to the Mac on time to stop Brady as Brady himself is successfully getting through security and into his seat and then sitting there waiting for the perfect moment to set off his bomb. Uh, We see Jerome drives. Holly is in the passenger seat, and Bill is in the back as he is frantically trying to get calls uh, to someone, anyone, Who can help? But of course, Matt, we know cell phones, uh, concerts, they don't work. This is true. Yeah, it is true. Uh, It it all, once again, I'm repeating myself now, but we're just laying on the like the the, the impossible Tetris level where the the blocks are falling too fast and you've, you've made mistakes. So now you've got, you know, an impossible situation and there's just no way you're just never going to be able to beat this Tetris level. You're going to lose this Tetris level any moment. I know that I'm making everyone feel really anxious by talking about Tetris because everyone experience, everyone has experienced what I'm talking about where you're watching a Tetris level get away from you. That's what's happening right here in the story. And the inability to make a phone call is the equivalent of one of those like sort of Z shaped blocks right at the moment when you don't need or want one of those. <laughs> just gonna let you go, man. Just keep going. Talk about Tetris more, please. Uh, do. I think that was good. I, I, I mean, I could probably write a whole book about storytelling using the metaphor of Tetris, but uh-huh, for now, I think yeah. that's good. <laughs> Z-shaped block. Yeah, you know what I mean. Which which one is the Z-shaped block? It's, it's got like it's like two on the bottom and then two offset. You know. Uh, I guess, yeah. Or S shaped, whatever. It's, I mean, both yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. Fucking man, those fucking <laughs> squares are just the worst ones when you're trying to dig your way out of a hole. Yeah, the squares Brady are pretty Hartsfeld. bad. Brady Hartsfeld is the square shaped block. In he is stressful Tetris game. I agree, and and Holly Gibney is the well, line. She's the line. She's the long straight one, straight like yeah. a, like a gunslinger. so stupid <laughs> i love it <laughs> no it was a good metaphor matt it was you you oh. really did capture the moment um and every time i tape, play tetris i'm gonna be thinking about brady hartsfeld yeah. and his good. pictures of his mom i'm glad that after you said it was stupid you you said you liked it that they i'll forget the first part yeah that, uh, good yes good no let me be clear the metaphor was good okay. the, the carrying on about it for okay. four minutes okay okay <laughs> Gotcha. And us and us continuing to look, we don't have a lot of time, is my point. And we're talking about Tetris. (laughs) No, I know. I know. (laughs) This this episode Um, is like a game of Tetris. (laughs) Oh, Jesus Christ. (laughs) Uh I I really love this part here. The truth is, she really doesn't want me to reach anyone, Hodges thinks, because it's supposed to be us and only us. A crazy idea comes to him that Holly is somehow is is using some weird psychic vibe to make sure it stays them and only them. <laughs> hey, that's what you were talking about earlier, right? Yeah. It's a crazy idea, Bill. It's a crazy idea. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. There's a couple of places in the text where it, it seems not totally crazy to think that maybe Holly's psychic. Um, but also I, I like the story doesn't require that at all. Like it, it's, mm-hmm. so I'm just, I'm just sort of viewing it as like, yeah, King kind of can't help himself from thinking yeah, about this, yeah. but I don't. He's winking at you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Finally, the team gets inside the MAC, but they've got a problem now, Matt. If they pull a fire alarm, if they start an evacuation, Brady will blow up the bomb. If security guards approach Brady, he's going to blow up the bomb. If he sees Bill Hodges, he's going to blow up the bomb. What the hell are they going to do? And then that's when we get this. It's got to be you, Holly. By now, he'll have his fingers on the trigger, and you're the only one who can get close without being recognized. She covers her abused mouth with one hand, but that isn't enough, and she adds the other. Her eyes are huge and wet. God help us, Hodges thinks. It isn't the first time he has thought this in relation to Holly Gibney. So, you know, there it is, Matt. Uh, Bill 
Bill is handing over the reins of his book to Holly. This yeah. is it. Yeah. And uh we'll see we'll see if she, is she going to she going to save the day? <laughs> do we do we we don't trust her to handle it nearly as much as we would trust our heroic and extremely experienced t- detective which I mean just to just to belabor the point goes further in the direction of like just making this the most impossible problem where we're just like, <laughs> how are our heroes going to survive this? Uh, and yeah, uh, yeah. somehow, somehow they do. Yeah. And, and, and I, I do like how like he has kind of symbolically passed a torch on to her and the book responds by leaving Bill Hodges behind. Like, like we said, with the exception of the, the moments that we've been in Brady's head and that one moment where we kind of, did that get that musical montage and jumped around to the different people in the town. We have been firmly in Bill's head this entire book. And now we're leaving Bill behind. And now we're in Holly's head. We're going to be in Holly's point of view. We're going to see things from Holly's perspective for the first time. And like we talked about a little bit earlier, this is such a fascinating move in this book in the 11th hour. Fuck at 1159 to hand the reins of this story on to a tertiary character who didn't show up for 250 pages. It is like, unusual. Yeah. Unusual. And like we said at the beginning of the episode, what's incredible to me is that it works as well as it does. Yeah. You know why? It's because these characters are so good. Because Holly is so good. Because Jerome is so good. And and they've just been so well characterized and fleshed out that, like, yes, Bill doesn't get to be the one to quote unquote win in that he doesn't get to be the one to swing the sock, as it were. But it's his sock still. Yeah, that's true. It's true. <laughs> uh, so as Holly heads into the concert to hopefully find and stop Brady, we do get to learn a bit more about her because we're in her head, really, for the first time. We learn, Matt, that Holly has had two psychotic breaks in her time, uh, but but like the cause of them are not just like she woke up one day and just lost her mind. Just terrible, awful things happened to her, right? Um, the first one, she was in her 20s where her boss propositioned her Uh, for sex in order to keep her job which is just like monstrous like horrible right um and and then the other one was in her teens when she was bullied we we see here the cause of her first total freak out was mike studervant he was the one who coined the pestiferous nickname jibba jibba um so matt let's let's talk about my theory here let's do it yeah i I mentioned this i said we're going to put a pin into holly's conversation with her mother and, and I want to preface with this with I, I have read and listened to a lot of Stephen King content before in my life. So if if I'm about to do something and, and hold something out as an original thought of mine, but I actually heard it from somewhere else first and I have forgotten that, I apologize that in it for that in advance. But Holly Gibney is Carrie White, Matt. What? Go on. What do you think about that? Well, OK, so Holly Gibney is not Carrie White, obviously. Holly Gibney is Carrie White if Carrie White didn't have it, have any powers to mm-hmm. kind of buck the systems that are keeping her down and destroying yeah. her. Like, what if Carrie White never got psychic powers? Right. Yeah, I like, like this idea. Holly Gibney in 40 years. Yeah. I, I, I like a lot about this. I really like the idea that, you know, in real life there are Carrie Whites and they don't typically – um, die in a massive blaze of glory when they're 18 they mm-hmm. have they have to live out the rest of their lives and what does that look like and here we see an example of that i think that's really interesting yeah the, the thing that unlocked this for me is that that phone call between holly and her mother i, I don't know for, for whatever reason when i read like i'm out with with mr hartsfeld and his friend jerome mama like the mama i read in Sissy Spacek voice, talking to Margaret White and arguing with Margaret White. Um, I, I don't know why my brain just did that. It just did it. And that like got me down a line of thinking. And I'm like, yeah, well, and she was heavily bullied in high school. And I do think, by the way, we see these two instances where she had these psychotic breaks. The first instance she talks about is when a man tried to force her to sleep with him in order to keep her job, which like, in, in in the the hierarchy of horrible abuse someone suffered, I feel like that goes higher than a, a boy was mean to me in school and called me a mean name, which, again, not trying to minimize that because that can be horribly traumatic to a kid. 
but it's pretty clear to Holly that like the high school one has cemented in her mind much, much more than the, some guy tried to get me to sleep with him for a job one, right? Like she goes into much more detail about Mike's Studervant and it is Mike Studervant's name that she utters when she takes revenge on Brady Hartsfeld. Right. Right. So it's, it's obviously clear that this event in her mind is, is a much more important defining one than this horrible thing that happens to her in her twenties. Yeah. It's like that first event was the one that established that the world is bad and shouldn't be trusted. And then the one that happened to her in her twenties is just sort of confirming that she was right in her, you know, assessment of the world being a shithole. Yeah, which is which is like it's not what happens to Carrie White, obviously, but it, it's it's a a young girl in high school being bullied for her differences. Um, Holly's difference in this case is being on the spectrum, right? Like once again, King never uses the word autism, but we do learn that one of Holly's ways of of dealing with her stress and anxiety is is stimming, um, which is which is definitely something that that people on the spectrum do right um and so like again we haven't used the words but we're essentially defining her that way yeah yeah exactly so so i mean i don't know am i am i completely off base here with the carrie white stuff i just i i I, part of me part of me wants this to be true because it becomes this really fascinating like career long examination of Stephen King where he like here's this character that has clearly just taken him over and he's he's been with this character now for you know four five six novels um and and for it to be a character that is not exactly but like loosely defined like the character that started it all there's just something so so delicious in the narrative of that the career arc narrative of that to me that I, I want it to be true. And perhaps what I'm doing is is willing it to be true more than it is actually true. But I, I, I like it. I like it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot in the construction of Holly Gibney that's very reminiscent of the construction of, of Kerry White. And it feels kind of like what he did with, uh, you know, in the explicit case of Father Callahan, where he, he, he thought he had, had said what he wanted to say, but then much later in his life found that he had more to say with this character. Where This is obviously not mm-hmm. the same li- literal character, but... It's a sort of type of person where maybe he thought when he was a young writer, a young man, he thought that he had said his piece about this type of human being or this type of situation. And then, you know, much later, having had a lot more life experience, realized that he had a lot more to say about this type of person. I mean, I, I think I'm just going to return to what I said a second ago. Like when you're a young man and when you're, when you're a young person and a young writer, your life experience is centered on young people. So the idea of a young person going out on a blaze of glory feels feels like a good way to tell that story. But then you get older and you realize yeah. like people just go on and on and on for decades and life just keeps kicking them in the in the ribs into their 40s and into their 50s. So he takes this character who maybe did start out life like Carrie White and he's like, "Okay, well, what if that except another 20 years of basically the same shit? What is what happens to that person and is there and, and and can there be some kind of beautiful, some kind of like beauty and redemption for someone who has been that downtrodden? And isn't that a compelling vision? Um, I really like that idea. I mean, yeah. I again, like whether he sees it as like Holly Gibney is Carrie White, I'm just kind of agnostic. But I, I mean, I can't help but see now that you pointed it out that there's a huge amount of similarity between these two characters in the archetype sense. Yeah, I, I especially like. Like the idea of what if she never got out of up from under Margaret, you know, like what would what would Margaret White be like when you're 40 and she's 60 something, you know, like, yeah, would she ever relinquish her grip on you? Probably not. Right. Yeah. Again, it's not it's not a religious thing in in the case of this story, but. Yeah, makes total sense. I I think it would be like you just make that that relationship a little a little bit less sort of dire where i mean cuz margaret white i think was <laughs> a, a dangerous and <laughs> and and kind of insane person but um but yeah it'd be basically a very similar dynamic yes yes absolutely mm-hmm. 
All right, so we are back with Brady as he sits there enjoying the last moments of his time, waiting for the perfect moment to fire off his bomb. When the concert reaches a true uproar, and sitting there, Brady looks over and notices for the first time Barbara, Jerome's sister, and he realizes that this is this is the sister of the 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 man he hates, and he decides in this moment, good, and he says, "Let Jerome live. That's fine, but without his sister or his mother." Let him see what it, that feels like. It's just, again, feels like Brady punishing people for the things he did to both his brother, his family, his brother and his his mother, right? Exactly. It's total cuckoo backwards land. <laughs> so as the carnival props dis- descend upon the concert, Barbara looks over and sees the wheelchair man flipping her off. <laughs> Matt, uh, I think I laughed out loud when I read this, and I think it's just because you're so tense about everything going on. As you said, this is like King ratcheting up the tension in every possible Avenue. And you're so tense. What's going to happen? When's it going to happen? And then suddenly like, here's a 28 year old man, like flipping off a little girl Uh that hasn't done anything to him at all. That is like, she's just a little girl enjoying a concert. And like, this is his final stand. This is his moment of triumph is is haha get it preteen like it's just it's so fucking pathetic and lame and it it made me laugh yeah yeah it's his meanness and stupidity here that jumps to the fore and also i think gives him away right isn't it because he did this that holly is able to kind of find him so easily it makes him stand out in that you know she might have had to to look amongst the wheelchaired Uh, guests a little bit more closely but he stands out yeah yeah for sure because he's making this ridiculous childish gesture yeah yep yep and then holly shows up and uttering the name of her high school tormentor beans brady hartsfeld right on the head with the happy slapper twice (laughs) never matt in in the history of fiction has there been a more satisfying moment in 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 storytelling just fucking nails him right in the head oh my gosh it's so nice i love it i love it so much it's incredible i love also i think bean is a a nice euphemism for crushes his (laughs) fucking skull uh (laughs) with with the sock i'm and by the way you know i was right about yeah chekhov's argyle sock obviously i'm sorry yeah not i have to give you credit where it's due that the chekhov's happy slapper um fully came out in force and you predicted it so well done sir well done i'm so happy (laughs) so uh matt as the as the new round here single plays on and on and frankly sounds kind of terrible from the little snippets of the the lyrics we get and, and most of the people in the concert are oblivious to what's happening holly is frantically trying to find the detonator and to stop and and ba- uh, uh, an even badly damaged brain damaged Brady from pushing down on the trigger and blowing them all up. Uh, she she does so thankfully, and then we cut back over to Bill, who's just hanging on on a crate, just like having a heart attack, uh-huh. <laughs> and and he doesn't want to do anything about it. Like he like he says, no, don't call a doctor. No, like if if Brady hears an ambulance, like there's nothing he can do. He's just so he's just stuck sitting there and waiting and waiting and hoping that they'll stop it. So it's like you know we talked about how holly kind of takes over the story and and has the final action but like i think forcing bill into a position where he just has to like wait and hope i think is ultimately good for him right like you know this this is a guy who needs to get used to being retired right like he's not a cop anymore and perhaps getting to trust that someone else is going to get the job done um is good for him ultimately yeah, absolutely. I like that you made a Count of Monte Cristo reference. By the way, I I <laughs> I, I, I caught that. Um, um yeah, I, I think it is good for him. I agree. There's something there's something healthy for his character in him not getting to be the big hero who actually kills Brady. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's fitting. It, it 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 ultimately ends up being fitting, even though you would have never predicted it. Um, right. But um, he he passes out from his heart attack, Matt, and and wakes up in a hospital with a very pissed off Pete above his bed, being like, "Hey, what, what the fuck, man?" Which uh, valid, like valid. Uh-huh. 
for sure. Did you, Matt, was there ever a moment in this that you thought Bill was going to die? Like, uh, you know, let's take the Bill Hodges trilogy out of the picture. Although I, you can't, but was there ever a moment where you thought, oh, this guy's going to die of this heart attack? No, um, I, I, I legitimately just was like, okay, he'll wake up at, at the hospital. Now that the primary threat has been removed, it would feel very tonally weird for him to die. Um, didn't, didn't think yeah. it would happen. All right. All right. That's fair. So we, we leave this scene behind and, and, and see quickly, you know, a little bit of, um, the, uh, we see a, a proclamation from the mayor, um, in, in what is, what is built as, I don't know, have we, we haven't done this in this novel yet, Matt, right? Like we have seen the letters or the messages, we have seen the letters that Brady sent, but we've never done this kind of, this is a whole section that's just the, the mayor's proclamation. There's no narrative here. There's no narrative voice here. It's just, it's, it's just, we've, we've cut out with the mayor's proclamation, uh, rewarding both, uh, Holly and uh, and Jerome medals of distinction for their their bravery here. Why do you think why do you think we relayed this information this way? What do you think? You know, I don't have a good answer. I I, I like this stuff, and I think King likes to do kind of format breaks. And I th- yeah. think well, well, he loves the epistolary stuff, right? He, he loves epistolary stuff, and I think it just is a really great way of sort of cutting forward like it's the film equivalent of like you fade out on the 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 sirens flashing as the as the bad guy is is caught and the good guys are triumphant Mm -hmm. and and then you fade in on like six months six months later title card and you, you you like reintroduce the situation and you since you can't really do that quite the same way in in a, in a book this is sort of the equivalent of that where it's like you're 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 reapproaching the characters through a different uh, uh structural conceit and that being the epistolary conceit and um i think I, I think these are just things that king knows they work and so he does them i i don't know how like calculated he is about these things but i i always love it when he does this yeah, no, I do too. I do too. But Matt, I mean, we have to notice here. There's nothing about Bill in this proclamation at all. Yep. No Bill Hodges here. He didn't get the keys to the city. <laughs> uh, he didn't. He didn't. He got nothing. He got nothing. No recognition for all his hard work. It's just Holly and Jerome. Yeah, he's he's the Chewbacca in this situation. Well, Chewbacca got to go to the ceremony at least. <laughs> I don't even think Bill's there. That's a good point. He's 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 sub Chewbacca. He's Wedge or something. <laughs> I think Wedge was there. Actually, he, he was there. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't have. I don't got anything for this. Okay. He's uh, he's Porkins. He's Porkins. <laughs> he's. <laughs> oh God, that's that's good. That's really good. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we open our epilogue chapter titled Blue Mercedes. Remember, the first chapter of the book was titled Gray Mercedes. Uh, it, it opens with Holly Gibney driving up to a park with Jerome and uh, and her aunt's Mercedes, and now repainted blue. We see Holly looks good, Matt. Ten years younger. She's quitting sp- smoking. She's more assertive. She's more confident. Everything seems to be going well for Holly Gibney. Yeah, uh, we're and we're happy to see it for sure. Yeah. And same thing with Bill, right? He's got a pacemaker now um, that seems to be working right along. He's lost 35 pounds, and we learn that nobody in the DA's office will be pressing charges for all the illegal stuff he did. All's well that ends well, I guess, because, again, because they won. This would be a very different story if they did not win. Yeah, exactly. Much like John Blackthorne says in Shogun, um, can, <laughs> can excuse a lot if you win. Much Paraphrasing. like John Blackthorne says in Shogun. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, right? I I was trying to think of a Tetris metaphor to mix in with your Shogun metaphor, and I came up with a blank. I'm sorry. It yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, me too. Just imagine. Just imagine it. Okay, I will. Um, so I, 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 one of my favorite things, this epilogue though, Matt, um, it says Jerome feels moved to call on Tyrone. Feel good delight. Massa Hodges, you free at last, free at last. Great God almighty. You is free at last. 
Stop talking like that, Jerome, Holly says. It's juvenile. And look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Holly just solved Jerome's identity crisis. Right? Yeah. In, in one fell swoop, uh, he just he just <laughs> needed to hear somebody say, hey, cut that cut that out. <laughs> yeah. That's, stop. Stop it. Hey. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> That's not you. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, it's perfect. And, and Holly, Holly being the person to call someone else juvenile, right? Where we, you know, both, both Brady and Holly, another, another comparison point there is they both act younger than their age. Holly was a a 44 year old woman who act like a teenager. Um, now she is the one pointing out other people's juvenile behavior. That's progress for both of them. Absolutely. We learned that Holly has moved out of her mother's house and into Olivia Trelawney's new place, finally on her own for the first time in her life. She's escaped from Margaret White without having to impale her, like, crucifix-wise. So good <laughs> good for you. Yeah, um, progress. This is partially thanks to Janie's half a million dollar uh, inheritance that she gives her, which, you know, was Janie's one more, like, her, her last little little attempt to to help her her cousin there i love that i love that so much me too uh and and we learn here that her mom is taking the separation far harder than she is but i i love this detail hodgett's visits her frequently far more important jerome visits frequently and holly is an even more frequent guest at the robinson home on teaberry lane hodges believe that's where the real healing is taking place not on dr Leibowitz's couch barbara has t- taken to calling her aunt holly so like, look at what's happening here. You pointed out the 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 fast friendship between Jerome and Holly, um, but we see that like this whole family has taken Holly under their wing, and uh, and that is incredibly good for her. Yeah, I love I love the idea of her being an aunt to a child, and like you know we've seen already kind of calling Jerome out on his juvenile behavior, like she's becoming not just a part of the family, but like a position of authority within the family. I think. Yeah, it's very cool. And um, I mean, not knowing anything else about where the direction of Holly's character goes, it, it's it sort of gets your wheels turning about what sorts of stories might be um, in store for this yeah. character. Yeah, for sure. For his part, Bill has been offered a job with, the, with a security agency, but he can't take it because the city is going to refuse to allow him to be bonded as a a private uh professional right no i'm sorry to inform you matt but there will be no private detective bill hodges in the future he can't do it they won't they won't bond him so he'll just have to be a a illegal criminal crime solver maybe he won't be a crime solver at all matt maybe it'll just be totally different stories i uh, also the thought crossed my mind at some point that like this is the last novel in the Bill Hodges trilogy, even though it was the first one written and maybe they're just out of order, you know, chronologically. I'm, I have no idea. I'm, I, I'm just, that's a possibility, right? Okay. Sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, anything's possible. Yep. <laughs> uh, and as for Brady Hartsfeld, Matt, um, we learned that he's in a coma after suffering, you know, having his skull caved in uh-huh. pretty serious injury there. Um, we we learn that you know he's probably not going to wake up but even if he does wake up he'll he'll probably poetically be more like Frankie after the apple than than Frankie before the apple right yep yep um but but here's how we end the book it's mr hartsfeld he's awake this only makes him look up but when the nurse says next gets him to his feet he spoke to me after 17 months extraordinary are you sure the nurse is flushed with excitement. Yes, doctor. Absolutely. What did he say? He said he has a headache and he's asking for his mother. Love it. How fitting, how perfectly poetic. So we're obviously not going to, as as formal episodes on the show, read additional uh, books in this trilogy. But do you think Brady Hartsfeld makes a return in the Bill Hodges trilogy? I mean, the thought w- the thought was on my mind, to be honest, because I want it like my first impulse is like, no, I feel like we I feel like we did this guy I feel like he's done and he has severe brain damage on top of everything. Mm-hmm. But like. Maybe I, I guess I don't want to give a firm no on this because I feel like this is an interesting character and I can imagine King wanting to come back to him 
maybe with something else to say. Sure. Don't know. Cool. Fun to think about. Uh, maybe one day you'll read those books and uh, and we'll circle up again and talk about them. But uh, for good. now, for now, that will have to remain unknown. I do like that. Like uh, he woke up from a coma after 17 months and is like, hey, can one of y'all uh, get my mom to jerk me off real quick, please? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got his priorities in order. <laughs> oh, got to love him. Well, that's it, Matt. That's Mr. Mercedes. That's the book pretty great ending i thought one of those one of those epilogues is just like oh everything's everything's wrapping up nicely in a nice neat bow everyone's happy they're doing well um except we're gonna just leave this dangling thread of the threat of brady hartsfield lives on and then uh and then say goodbye i think it's i think it's pretty perfect yeah i agree it's a very very tight ending yeah and we will talk about the book as a whole on our episode next week but before we wrap things up, Matt, we have a discussion question to answer, I believe. What was the what was last week's question? Uh, so the question was, what is the most effective late recontextualization of a character's past that changes your feelings about them? Um, so so this first one, I'm, this first this is not an actual answer, and, and I pulled it specifically because I thought it was relevant to our conversation and just wanted to have it on the record. Uh, that uh, Violet Offender 19 says they are a clinical social worker whose job involves diagnosing people and they feel compelled to respond. They have the handy dandy DSM desk reference and they say that Brady has antisocial personality disorder. He may also have narcissistic personality disorder. Um, and this being the case, he may be termed a malignant narcissist, though that is not a clinical term. They say that Brady's mother's treatment of him as a substitute spouse probably tipped him over the edge, though he may have went that way anyway. Um, and that personality uh, personality disorders are the result of some kind of abuse, trauma, damage during childhood. Um, but antisocial personality disorder may not necessarily have that experience. Uh, but that, but it, it, anyway, uh, it's a it's a useful comment. We appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to have some actual knowledge uh, injected into our just endless uh, bloviating and bullshit. I, I thank you for putting it better than I ever could. Um, <laughs> it is absolutely true that we have no idea what we're talking about. And it is great when people do. So uh, we'll always support that. Thank you for sharing that. I, 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 re I replied to their comment in the thread. Uh, but I, I think it's great that we shared this here for people that don't check the Reddit because, yeah, we don't know what we're talking about. But some people do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, busy dad 82 says it took a lot of books to get to it but the most effective recontextualization of a character has got to be professor snape for several books he's an apparent antagonist to harry not only hiding his true purpose as harry's protector but hiding his love for harry's mother lily for all those years to also find out that harry's father james was a bully to snape puts his complicated feelings towards harry in an even better context i guess we should say generally that there's probably going to be a lot of spoilers in uh in these the the answers this week um yeah i'm not really worried about spoiling harry potter for people listening to episode 257 of kingslingers cuz y'all have probably already read harry potter or you don't care um that's a good answer, though. I like yeah. that. Just have that pause button ready if if you do care. Yeah. Uh, Jaraxus Eridar Lord says, the most fascinating reframing of a character, in my opinion, is Laura Palmer in Twin Peaks. Since uh -oh, the viewer... Uh, no, uh, I don't know. <laughs> should we should we skip this one? Um, um, I mean, do you want to watch Twin Peaks, Matt? Um, possibly. Someday. It's on the list. I guess Laura Palmer is a good is a good recontextualization. But how? In which way? Uh, we'll never know until we watch Twin Peaks. We'll never know. So I guess now <laughs> I have to. I'll I'll go watch Twin Peaks and then I'll come back and I'll read this answer. Can you just watch the Wild Bunch first, please? Okay, I will. I promise. Thank you. Uh, Pedro De Niro 77 says Jamie Lannister comes to mind spoilers for Game of Thrones in part because not only do you the reader feel your own sense of the character shift it's accompanies uh, it accompanies a devastating physical change for the character and thus he goes through his own reframing of his life at the same time um, I, yeah I mean I think that's one you pointed out but I think that's one of the best examples of it and, and, and I'll just remind everyone because sometimes you forget 
when you read these books for long enough, but like Jamie Lannister's introduction to us in the novel is fucking a sister and then pushing a child out of a window to his certain death, right? Like uh-huh. you can't get much more down and out <laughs> than yeah. that. Um, and his his transformation over the course of the books is right. pretty remarkable. It's it's a it's genius storytelling, yeah. Uh, Apocalypse mm-hmm. Win 7 says, I nominate Martin Scorsese's Hugo. It plays on the familiar tropes of the old curmudgeonly man and the young protagonist who discovers that the man has a rich and tragic backstory. It just so happens that this particular old man is not, none, none other than uh, Jorge Melies. I don't know how to say that. Uh, the silent filmmaker who pioneered the, fan- the fantasy and science fiction genres. If you've ever seen that image of the man in the moon with the rocket in its eye, that's the guy. Um, yes, they say, in Hugo, we first meet him as a jaded, depressed toy vendor who rejects his past. The titular Hugo helps him embrace cher- and cherish his accomplishments rather than lament his lost dreams. Yeah, I, I, good answer. I've seen that movie. I forgot about forgot about all that stuff but now that you've mentioned it i remember it so thank you i really love that movie i really love that movie uh next we have pear jane who says if i can answer pride and prejudice to a question i will always answer pride and prejudice the entire plot of the book is based on judging folks on first impressions hey kind of like this one and then learning the truth of their backstories and mr wickham's backstory is a doozy on first glance elizabeth is less than impressed with the stuffy mr darcy and chimed by the wiles of mr wickham but we find out in short order that Mr. Wickham is a scoundrel of the highest order, leaving despoiled young ladies adrift and devastated all over England. And this reminds me that I want to watch Being Mr. Wickham, a one-man show that came out a few years back where the actor who played Wickham in the 1990s BBC adaptation sets the record straight on what really happened, thus offering even more backstory on the backstory. I regret to inform being Mr. Wickham is not a musical and will not feature such such classic book hits as cake for lunch, boat necked blouts, this dog or the dog, not you fedora in flames or John Belushi killed my brother. I think that's a that's Jody giving us some song titles for the Mr. Mercedes musical cake for lunch as my favorite uh, smash Broadway hit actually. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. I'm sure you Matt uh, appreciate fedora and flames. I I do, I do. I so I, I'm so ignorant about everything relating to all of this that I just I'm sure there's all kinds of amazing rich jokes that are just whizzing over my head and I can sort of hear them whizzing, but I I, I, I don't know. What is it that you don't understand? Are these they're just song? They're just song titles. But I don't recognize a single one of these song titles. They're made up. They're oh, not. They're, okay. they're, they're not. Do you real. remember the? Do you remember the hidden bonus? I do. Request that we I, had last week. But I was. I thought maybe they were real song titles, and I was like, No. Okay. Got it. Thank you. I mean, look, some of them might actually coincidentally be real song titles, but no. Look, this is just if if there was a Mr. Mercedes musical, what would what, your song list be? Okay, but what's happening here is knowing Pear Jane, I just expected these to all be clever <laughs> dual meaning actual song titles that also double as references to this book. But anyway. Well, you hear that, Jody? Uh Matt is disappointed in you. <laughs> uh you expect the impossible and uh you get you get merely the humorous um anyway uh uh, darian tyro said uh for this week's question i'm gonna write uh, gonna go with episode five of the hit 2005 anime avatar the last airbender the king of omashu In the episode, the main character Aang and his friends Sokka and Katara come to the enormous city of Amashu. They make it inside and explore a bit as Aang tells stories of his friend Bumi, who he knew and played with in the city before he, Aang, was frozen in ice for a hundred years. After a while, their exploration and play... uh, after a while of their exploration and play making them a menace, the Avatar and his friends are brought before the king, who presents as a kooky and sometimes annoying individual who first throws them a feast, during which he forces Aang to reveal his airbending, thus exposing who he really is, then imprisons Sokka and Katara in Creeping Crystal while making Aang do three deadly challenges, all of which require outside-the-box solutions. All this c- culminates in the king of Amashu's final challenge, Guess My Name. After some time to think, Aang realizes that his friend Bumi lived over a hundred years and is still standing before him as the king of Amashu, completely recontextualizing not only King Bumi and his actions, but all, all of the challenges as well. 
the episode is a masterclass in this sort of character reveal, in my opinion. This yes. is a great answer. I really enjoy the show, and I really like that episode. And Matt, something I'm happy to report is that the live-action Netflix show handled this episode perfectly. Really? No. Oh. <laughs> they <laughs> fucked it up. <laughs> I believed you for a second, honestly. I was like, oh, really? They did something right? Oh, no. Okay. Never mind. Nope. My bad. No. Nope. Okay. Nope. Uh, uh, next, we have Baby Can You Dig Your Sam, who says, Saul Goodman slash Jimmy McGill. I love how I got six full seasons to watch Jimmy McGill become Saul Goodman. His relationship with his brother and King Kim so helped to show who he was and why he made the choices he did. Seeing him become Gene and the choices of a post Breaking Bad Saul Goodman still still makes i don't know if it actually changed what i thought about him but i definitely had a much more thorough understanding of his motivations worst recontextualization making marty mcfly not be able to bear being called a chicken seriously this was not remotely a character trait in the original and they cram it into the final two installments i hated it then and i hate it now yeah true on both counts matt i still haven't finished uh better call saul and i just really need to get my ass on that but yeah that's um, that's great, and and I agree with the Back to the Future complaint. Although I did see in the thread that there was some response to this, that was some Back to the Future one slander, which I just have to I just have to let everyone know that that is just completely unacceptable. Yeah, that's not something that we endorse or or countenance really on this podcast. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, Sam also mentions Walter White as well, uh, which I think is this is this is fair. Yeah, that as that is learn, fair. As we learn more about him, we learn that he is actually just a fucking monster. Yeah, although that, that that's less less like backstory being provided, and just like we see him continue to make choices, and many of them yeah. are yeah. bad. So, mm -hmm. um, all right, Apocalypse Win Seven says uh, they're going to take <laughs> us up on the Broadway uh, track listing, and uh, I'm so happy someone did this. <laughs> I I don't know if we need to read every single one of the the songs on the set list unless you really want to but uh, it's it, remarkable what apocalypse win has done here yeah it doesn't really super well lend itself to like audio as just like a list of words but i i, I like uh, i like debt ret as a name like that 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 does seem like a perfect um a perfect name um well but he also gives a a, a quick description of what these songs would be and debt red he describes as a jaggy a jazzy jazzy instrumental where you can almost hear the haze of cigarette smoke in the smoke in the dimly lit interior with your occasional punctuation of classic rock guitar solo as Hodge red, hodges i can't read reminisces about his youth uh, that one's that one's great and they also say there's debt red reprise uh later mm -hmm. which is the same jazzy tune we heard before but now with a more determined vengeful brass band tone um i, I like a uh, second uh, favorite would be uh, mother knows best uh with the caption i don't want to explain this one um oh, I, I like thing one and thing two i can almost hear that a jaunty number where uh -huh. brady describes what his homemade devices do mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh yeah i just want to point out you said reprise uh -huh. that's reprise is it I don't actually know. So I thought it was Reprise. And then I was listening to uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, a show I quite like. And in that show, uh, they called it Reprise. And she knows a lot about Broadway. So I assume she would be correct. But that just seems like a weird way to pronounce that word. So I honestly don't know. So because I don't people say like he reprised his role that they, they say he reprised his role. They say he reprised his role, but perhaps when you're talking specifically about the Broadway yeah. act of a song coming back later in a slightly different tone, for some reason you pronounce it reprise. I don't know. Is yeah. what I, 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 it's, it's ridiculous. Words right. are silly. Well, I'm sure we're not going to get any comments uh, correcting us on this in any yeah. case. Yeah. Um, I, I just have one more request for Apocalypse Win. You say here at the bottom that uh, for the rest of the soundtrack, well, that would be spoiler territory. Well, guess what? You can share now. So yeah. we want to hear what are the what what is the what is the closing number on Mr. Mercedes the musical? Please let us know. Yes. 
All right, we have OK Row 2424 who says, My favorite detail that recontextualizes everything about a character is Ransom Drysdale from Knives Out. At the beginning of the movie, we see how much of a jerk he really is, but then think that he's on our ice, our side as we see after, after we see that his whole family is made of jerks. But then when we realize that he's the real killer, <laughs> maybe we should... Spoilers. You know, we warned people at the beginning. Uh, we realized all the moments between him and Martha were actually Ransom manipulating Martha into doing things that will make her look more guilty and get Ransom the money from Harlan's will. Excellently done. And when you rewatch the movie, you see small details that show the fact that Ransom's been behind the scenes all along, such as a decorative bottle missing from his house because he used it as a Molotov earlier. An excellent twist that makes you see moments in the film much differently. Whoa. I don't think I ever caught the missing bottle one. I sure didn't. I gotta, I gotta rewatch this movie. Yeah, I've only seen it the one time. I bet there's a lot of stuff that jumps out to you on a rewatch, though. That's yeah, I've seen it a couple times, and it's yeah, definitely, cool. definitely, cool. All right, I think that was it, right? That's uh, that's it. That's it. Yeah, great answers, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, next week on the show, it's our overview episode, which means it's time for another mailbag episode. I know it's only been like a month and a half since our last mailbag, so probably not a whole lot of new questions popping up that you want answered. But of course, you can ask us stuff about uh, Mr. Mercedes uh, or, you know, I guess Holly and Bill um, and then any other questions you want. This is, by the way, the penultimate mailbag. So. You're only going to have one more mailbag. So if you have any questions you were like holding, uh, now would maybe be a good time to, to send those in because we're, we're rapidly approaching the end. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, cool. So that's that's the episode, Matt. We're done. We did it. We did, Mr. Mercedes. Uh, as, as we said already, next week we will do our overview episode. We'll take one last look at the book. We'll answer your discussion questions. And we might just have a special announcement too. Ooh. All right. Sounds Ooh. sounds exciting. I'm Ooh. excited. Whatever could it be? I can't wait to find out. Yeah, me too. Wait. No, what? I know. Oh, okay. So so do I. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but in any case, remember you can reach us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or over on Twitter at kingslingerspod and the subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash doofmedia is the best place to hang out uh, and, and while away the days. And you definitely also want to head over to doofmedia.myshopify.com where you will find all the mugs you could ever want. I have so many mugs in my house because I buy each and every one of the mugs that we've put for sale. I can't stop because I love them so much. I have so many mugs, but they're such great looking mugs. And of course, a bunch of other merch. Please check them out, of course, including the Propagating the Time Wave and uh, the Bliss Orb mugs, which are now in the shop. and and excellent please check them out they make me so happy mm -hmm. if you like any of our shows and you want to support us then please consider donating to our patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia and if you cannot afford to donate right now that is absolutely okay you can help out by sharing this podcast with all your stephen king loving friends or just randomly on social media uh let them know I, there's matt stephen king been tweeting about the dark tower a lot so yeah you might want to there might be a reason for you to get all your friends to read the Dark Tower soon, maybe, possibly. So, uh, yeah, it's it's unclear, but it's exciting in any case. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so share, share the podcast, share the Dark Tower, do do all, do all the things, and also please leave a rating and a review on uh, any any platform. You know, I was told that Spotify has a new rating or review feature, but um, either we haven't gotten any or. That was just wrong because I don't see any there. No. Uh, we don't have any new ones over at Apple either. Um, so no reviews to read this week. But uh, but don't worry. Um, Matt is probably not going to set a book on fire this week. But oh, next week, you better you better watch out. I ran out of matches. So. Oh, yeah. You're lucky. You buy some, some more. I will. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, that's going to do it for us this week. We'll see you back here next week for our conclusion of our time with Stephen King's Mr. Mercedes. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Bye.